Before we begin, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Um, this event is unclassified, open to the public, and it is being recorded, so please keep that in mind. If you have any problems with Zoom, please see the troubleshooting tips in your confirmation uh, for your registration. Also, if you have questions for the panels, please send those to me as soon as possible, and I will try to get them to the moderators. Okay, so today we have an impressive group of speakers covering an interesting set of topics. Our first panel is on technology competition in the Pacific, moderated by Dr. Corey Shockey. Our second session, uh, for our second session, we'll be hearing remarks from Vice Admiral John Hill of the Missile Defense Agency on competing in the Pacific from a missile defense perspective. Um, Admiral Hill was unfortunately unable to attend today, but he recorded uh, comments that we will be playing um, later on. And those comments will be a nice segue to our second panel on competing in the Pacific in an era of evolving missile threats, um, moderated by Aaron Mehta of Breaking Defense. And last, Dr. Kerry Buckley of MITRE uh, will offer some conclusionary remarks. With that, I will hand it over to the moderator for the first panel. It's a huge honor for me to introduce Dr. Corey Shockey. Um, you know, Corey is someone uh, who's had an incredibly impressive career, both in and out of government. Um, she is a prolific writer on defense and foreign affairs issues, and I think um, you know, most remarkably and, and most singularly, uh, Corey is someone who in this field, everyone seems to revere. Um, and that, that, is, that is really unusual um, when you're thinking about foreign affairs and uh, defense policy experts. Um, you know, and I would, just, I would just hope that in addition to steering the conversation today, that, that Corey offers some of her own perspectives um, because I know that I and our listeners, our viewers, uh, will find those of high interest. Okay, with that, I am going to turn it to Corey. Thank you, my friends. That was very generous and kind of you. Um, I have the fun this morning of moderating a panel of people who are actual experts on the technology challenges in the Indo-Pacific. And I want to say, starting out, we are missing at this moment retired Brigadier General Steve Buto, the DIU Director of Space. Um, and I feel like that's a fabulous place to start our conversation, which is the guy whose job is innovation is late to the party. And it feels like a metaphor for where we are in technology and turning our attention to the Indo-Pacific. We have with us two terrific panelists this morning, Dr. Kiyoki Jackson, the Senior Vice President and General Manager of MITRE. Uh, he's been, he holds a PhD from MIT, as you can see. Hold up your right hand, my friend. Um, the beaver insignia on his ring. Uh, and was also a NASA fellow at MIT, and Thomas Shugart, a Navy veteran who has been the operational end of this challenge. He is currently a senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security, where he runs undersea and maritime programs. Uh, he comes out of the Office of Net Assessment in the Pentagon. And as I mentioned, late to the innovation party, Retired Brigadier General Steve Budo, the Director of Space Policy at the Defense Innovation Unit, and he has built the teams in California, in Texas, uh, Thomas Shugart's alma mater, he studied mechanical engineering at the University of Texas. Steve built the team for uh, DIU in Austin and also in Boston. And uh, I have just finished reading a really fun book, Elliot Ackerman and Jim Stavridis' 2034. And it's a book about 
the consequences of our political moment in the United States, but also of falling behind in the technology competition with China. So the first question I want to run down the panel is, do you think the United States has maintained its technological edge over China? Starting with you, Kiyoki. Make sure I've got the audio edge uh, going here. <laughs> uh, look, there's no doubt that uh, there has been substantial erosion of the technological edge. And I, I mean, I'd characterize it as there are clear areas where the United States is ahead and a clear world later, but that gap uh, has shrunk very rapidly. And frankly, there are areas uh, where I'd say the Chinese uh, and potentially the Russians are ahead. And so, um, you know, as you look at this this landscape, uh, I mean, I would just start with a very clear Chinese strategy that's been articulated years ago now to drive technological advantage in areas that are clearly, uh, you know, geared towards military capabilities, but by and large have dramatic um, economic uh, considerations as well. So the intent to dominate, you know, in this 25, 20, 30 time frame in areas like microelectronics, artificial intelligence, quantum information sciences, you can kind of go down that list, you know, biological sciences, and it's pretty clear that this is a long thought out and very, very well resourced strategy to surpass the United States. And I would argue that they are making great progress on that plan. Tom, what do you think? I certainly agree with the overall assessment there. Um, and, you know, when you look at areas where they're ahead, in particular, I look at, and, and, and certainly in terms of scale, hmm. when I look at the, their, the PLA rocket forces, missile forces, for example, you know, we're just now working on intermediate range, uh, conventional, precise ballistic missiles. You know, the Army, we have a, a joint program where the Army's working with the Navy, but it's still early days with that, as opposed to the latest China military power report, 200 plus launchers and 300 missiles in service. Uh, that are, you know, precise, conventional, swappable warhead, um, intermediate range uh, ballistic missiles. You know, obviously there are areas where we hold significant advantage. You know, I, I, I'm best familiar with the undersea. It's no secret that China's submarines, for example, are still noisy. Uh, their nuclear ones, at least, are, are still noisy. Uh, but, I, but I worry that that gap could close to in the future, um, particularly when I think about collaboration with the Russians, um, you know, who, who do have some very quiet submarines. Um, so they're they clearly recognize those areas where they're far behind, and the ones that matter, they're clearly working to close. I'm glad you mentioned the 2034 book. Actually, it's on my uh, nightstand, so I'm getting ready. <laughs> I read to, it recently too. Yeah, I'm getting ready to read it. Um, I would agree. The, the um, I, I think the um, we, we probably have some regret about uh, shifting a lot of our manufacturing offshore, uh, the industrial base, uh, and really the, the underlayer of of our of our industrial capacity um, is, is, uh, is not in a healthy state today. And so, and that underpins many things, whether it's aerospace, uh, maritime, um, you know, our ability to uh, rare earth metals, you know, uh, and minerals. Uh, these are all things that are, are critical to uh, preserving uh, U.S. leadership uh, and not to mention talent, right? So, um, so we, have a, we have our homework to do uh, but you know we have some um, there's some glimmers of hope you know uh, I, you know Ch China price less profusely whenever they see uh, what's going on down at Boca Chica with uh, with uh, Elon Musk and and SpaceX uh, and there and there's other things like that but but uh, uh, this is going to be a whole nation I issue it's not just the Department of Defense or or Department of Education uh, this is a, it's going to be a whole nation uh, solution to uh, to really address what we need to do so that the United States preserves its leadership through the 21st century. That's such an interesting point. So I always despair when um, people in the defense ecosystem talk about the need for whole of nation strategy. Because uh, the last time I can think of that any Americans had a whole of nation strategy, it was the Shawnee Confederacy in 1805. Mm. Um, and, and so, if your strategy requires whole-of-nation effort, it seems to me you have a failing strategy. 
And that's part of the challenge we have in the contest with China, because authoritarian governments can direct activity, and as Kiyoki has said, have directed activity in productive ways in the technology space. But I want to ask, how much do you think, so, so our mythology, the story we tell ourselves as Americans, is that there is a trade-off in innovation between directed activity and creative activity. Right, and you use the Elon Musk example. That's right. Um, but the flip side of that coin, it seems to me, is that if you look at the success of the Asian tigers, the economies of Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, they actually did have successful investment strategies to create industrial strategies effectively. We're not going to have that. Mm -hmm. um, is that Un, an unrecoverable failure on our part, or can the big sloppy innovation ecosystem of the United States somehow compensate? Well, it's, it's an interesting question. I, first of all, you know, my conviction is that in the long term, you know, the, the ingenuity and the rewards that come with a more of a bottoms up and uh, capitalist driven approach uh, that uh, favors I'd say individual results uh, over state-directed approaches uh, has been very successful for the United States and, frankly, for the West for a long, long time. Um, now, of course, you have to survive the short term to get to the long term, and I think right. that's, you know, the short term could be years or decades, right? And so that's the challenge that we face here. Um, I think, you know, it, a little bit of it depends on what you define as industrial policy and, you know, where's the line between, you know, picking winners and losers in particular sectors versus doing the kinds of things that raise all boats. And I do think there are some glimmers of hope, although I will tell you it's built on, I'd say, a lot of years of despair. Um, you just look at the infrastructure for innovation in this nation, the things that were the crown jewels that drove a lot of the advances that became our, you know, the, the, the core of our economy today and our military, our national laboratories, uh, places like NIST, uh, our service laboratories, our test infrastructure, places like NASA um, and, the, and the military services in massive disrepair, underinvested over decades, you know, billions and billions of dollars of deferred maintenance, not to mention lack of investment in new capabilities. So these are the places where short of a, I'd say a specific industrial strategy, investments there can really make a difference for the nation. And we are starting to see some, uh, you know, in, in some of the latest uh, spending plans, some significant plus ones. Excellent. Um, Steve, I in particular want to hear from you on this. Mm -hmm. Well, it, I, I think what your comment about the uh, lack of strategy or failed strategy, I, I think um, I want to go back to that first because I, I think it's, uh, we have no strategy. And when I say no strategy, I mean grand strategy. Um, China is, is methodically executing a grand strategy to uh, displace the U.S. As a, as a world leader in, by their 100th anniversary of Communism in 2049, and um, and they're they're just chugging along uh, doing that. Um, I think what's important for us is just recognize, okay, well that's their pursuit, but uh, but that, but we we need to have a long term strategy. And uh, as the United States, that grand strategy could be simple things that everybody agrees to, like uh, um, you know the the preservation of the international liberal order, or uh, or you know, freedom, or or the idea that that uh, we have free trade you know, with with international partners. These are these are these are things that are that need to be part of the discussion today. Um, now going back to the uh, uh, the industrial base, um, uh, boy, I tell you. Uh, so I was just at a, a meeting yesterday, and we we're lamenting about you know the, there's 150,000 uh, less machinists today than there was uh, 20 years ago, right? And um, so uh, a lot of the a lot of skills, a lot of the, a lot of things that we that we used to rely on uh, just aren't there anymore. But um, another interesting factoid is that um, uh, is the United that a function of automation. Well, it's it's a I think it's a function of evolution, right? Because we've also gone to more uh, 
uh, computer-based, you know, CNC type of machining and things of this nature, uh, you know, use of robotics. But I, I also think that um, if you look, uh, the United States today uh, controls about 12% of the semiconductor market, which, you know, when I, I grew up in Silicon Valley, which is that was staggered, that's pretty staggering, and it's probably shrinking, <laughs> too. But you know what? When, uh, what that means is that it's an ideal time for disruption. So uh, I'll remind everybody we're in aerospace today, and so these folks are the experts on it. But, you know, the United States probably controlled about, you know, an equal percentage of commercial launch a decade ago. And then what we did is we uh, disrupted the market, and, and uh, we have reusable spacecraft, uh, launch vehicles, and things of like this. And now, now the U.S. is, is in a large, you know, it's probably the lion's share of the commercial watch market. So it's, it's achieved that through disruption, which is a form of innovation uh, that that's uh, very critical to the way that um, we preserve our, our our strength. And one that is consistent with the underlying political culture of the country. Mm -hmm. It does seem to me that one of America's enormous advantages in the challenge we are facing by China is the genuine risk tolerance of Americans. Yeah. Um, not only are we people who moved into Indian territory, but like we're people in one of the wealthiest countries in the world with free vaccines during a pandemic where a third of the country chooses not to take them. That tells you something about risk tolerance, and we need to play to our own actual strengths in this competition. I do, though, want to disagree with you mm -hmm. about the U.S. not having a grand strategy on China. And I'm, I'm going to point this at you, Tom, because I think not only do we have a grand strategy, we have the right grand strategy, and we've had it for about 35 or 45 years, which is that we created an international order that maximizes the ability of small and middle powers to shape the rules. And as a result, the American-dominated international order isn't just good for us, it's good for others who can help preserve it, but couldn't under any other system have the benefits they have. This is the magnetism of the international order. That is, it is states benefit most when they opt into the rules of the order, and it maximizes the help we get from others. And I think we have a fabulous current example of this, which it, so what we are trying to do is cajole and coerce China into playing by the existing rules. This Chinese government clearly has rejected that approach, right? It should have been clear from about 2007 that this was the path that China's government was on. It's been evident since at least, well, even the Obama administration admits they should have seen it by 2014. So one of the things that's interesting about our current moment is you can feel the gears meshing of the government, of the business community, of um, average Americans like my mom, changing their appreciation of what China is after and beginning to appreciate the importance of preserving the existing order. We have a really interesting creative example of that, of the United States playing team sports with its allies to try and band together, as Kiyoki suggested, to preserve the existing order. I'm talking about the AUKUS agreement, Thomas. Help us understand what it is, how big are the submarines uh, as a c component of it, given that they're not going to be online for a while, and what is the technology cooperation beyond submarines that this means for us? So AUKUS is, it seems to be a lot of things. Um, and in terms of a number of technology sharing aspects to the deal. But the one that certainly has gotten everybody's attention is the pretty unique sharing of Lightning, now it's two countries, um, nuclear propulsion technology. So previously, the only other country that the U.S. had shared submarine or nuclear propulsion technology with was the United Kingdom. And that was dating back to the 1950s, as we, went to, as we also were grappling with the scale of the challenge that we were going to be involved in. Um, so... We've decided to work with the Australians to provide that technology to them as well. I, I see it being the deal being driven as kind of a push-pull uh, factors to it. And that one, 
it was clear to observers that were paying attention to the French Australian deal moving forward that that program wasn't going well. Um, it was delayed. The, the the price of the of the program in terms of you know price per per ship. I had I sometimes wondered if I was converting the numbers incorrectly or something. Like it, it's an astronomical cost for what they were what they were going to get. So there was no surprise there amongst a lot of folks that there was a, a push away from that program. Then you have a poll based on the geopolitical reality and the military reality in the Western Pacific that maybe that platform wasn't going to work quite so well with, the, with the, the, the challenge from the Chinese Navy. There might have been a time where conventionally powered diesel electric submarines with relatively limited speed and relatively limited endurance could have made sense against the Chinese Navy that was mostly coastal defense or operating in, in its near seas. That time has passed. It's very clear that they are well on their way to being a global blue water Navy. Uh, and the nuclear propulsion may make a lot more, will make a lot more sense uh, for being able to deal with that because you can't count on just dealing with the, the PLA Navy close to China anytime in the future, certainly not 20 years from now. Um, I'm of the opinion that they will have largely wrapped up sea control in 10 or 15 years within the first, certainly the first island chain, maybe the second island chain, with hardly even using their Navy. They'd be mostly a land based sea power um, using missiles, land based aircraft. Uh, and some small number and some numbers of uh, smaller escorts for anti-submarine work. So, so there's a lot. Of, there's a clear military reality that's driving that need for cooperation, and I'm very glad to see it. Anybody else want to come in on August? Yeah. Well, let me just add. I mean, I think it really highlights a bigger trend, which is the importance of allies and partners to uh, to strategic deterrence for the U.S. to maintaining, you know freedom of navigation, all these kinds of elements that tie into the rules-based order here. And so when you think about the importance of what Tom just said there, I mean, the fact that you have three nations sharing technology, you know, expand that out and think about, you know, what are the considerations for true military interoperability in this phase from competition through crisis to conflict? And so what it highlights is to me, you know, it's not just about, say, the submarine. It's about the weapon systems. It's about the command and control systems. It's about how do we become, you know, be able to do pickup games, if you will, uh, pre-planned perhaps, uh, to truly interoperate um, across all of these dimensions. Um, and so I think this is just the first stage of where we're headed. I agree with that. I really like the DIU director, um, Michael Brown's notion that we're worried about China having big data because they have a big population. And if we and our allies can find means to cooperate deeply on technology, on data, um, that we actually have a scale much greater than the Chinese have. But we have to work on this cooperation. We've got to get that piece right. I can think of a couple of interesting, successful examples. I'd be interested if any of the three of you would like to add more. The first is rare earths, which, which Steve mentioned already. Um, you know, the Japanese got the brunt of China's uh, forward-looking grand strategy in 2010 when, during a minor fishing dispute, China shut off Japan's ability to import rare earths. And the Japanese countered with a fantastic um, strategy, which is encouraging Chinese to break their own, right? Like small businesses yeah. to break the embargo. Second, they invested deeply in Australian mines. And third, they started, um, they spurred innovation in their own companies to rely less on rare earths. And fourth, they started thinking about how do we create secure supply chains and the partnership with Australia on that, which all four of those are important and we need to be thinking in that kind of way. So I love that example. The Department of Energy and the Department of Defense are now reopening mines and processing in the United States, in Wyoming, Texas, and California. Rare earths aren't actually rare. They're just messy and they're not concentrated. And so we have outsourced, exactly as Steve said, we outsource to countries that don't have the same level of environmental regulation as we do um, and that can do it less expensively. That is a fixable problem. What are the Where do you guys see 
other places where there are fixable problems that we just need to get our act together and need to work with our allies on this. Steve, you first. I was just going to add that uh, we have six portfolios at the Defense Innovation Unit. The newest one is Advanced Energy and Materials, and there's a growing market of reclaiming, uh, you know, rare earths from just yeah. recycling and things like this. So that so when we talk about uh, the disruption and innovation, and as you say, you know, it's that they're only rare if you you know consider you know the sources, but they're but uh, there's plenty of resources and how, how we make use of them. But, um, but uh, um, another comment I wanted to make too, uh, because I will see to you that yes, yeah, that there is a grand strategy that's working. Um, when I look at China today, China's very complex by the way. Uh, and, uh, and especially if you compare the Western provinces to the Eastern provinces, but China looks more like the Western world today than it did, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. So we're winning in that respect. And I, I think this may be under, you know, this may be the fuel behind the fire of, of, the, of the authoritarians and, and who are really trying to uh, grasp and, and maintain their power base. So, so uh, I, will, I will see that to you. I think that's right. I think at a time where we in the West um, are questioning whether our values are universal, the people who believe our values are universal run China and right. Russia. The, um, we're in the business of pay, spending a lot of time with small companies, and the small startup companies in China, they emulate um, entrepreneurs in the West. They they want to they want to be like the, the you know the Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk types, and 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 uh, and, uh, and so they uh, the ecosystem that they're in. Uh, you know, through civil military fusion, they ha they have to have some relationship to the uh, to the army, but it's it's not really apparent until the army wants what they want. But the uh, but I, I think that's that's really good. And so I, I think it's I think the balancing act is that we want to keep the uh, evolving parts of China that that want to be integral parts of of the global economy. We want them to grow and and, and build power and all that stuff. At the same time, we need to we need to kind of curtail the appetite of, of, of the authoritarian elements within the CCP, the PLA, who are really trying to disrupt and, and, and change um, uh, the world order. And, 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 and I think what's happening is the more exposure, the soft power aspect of this is really key. One of the areas where you're going to love this, uh, we, we have all these uh, projects, so one of them is called XView3, and what we're doing is we're taking commercial imagery and analytics, and we're looking for illegal fishing activity. Ah. And you know, and the way we're doing it is we're paying. Uh, you know, if you're an engineer at Google, you do 14 hours a day of making a web advertisement better. Then you go home, you drink a jolt, and then and you start working on interesting problems like like one of these challenges that we have. And so what's happening is we have we have uh, people using publicly available data that are buying and they're basically highlighting illegal ship uh, fishing activity where China is basically decimating the, the uh, maritime ecosystems around around not just you know uh, Mexico uh, other places the Gulf Coast all that but also around North Korea oh, uh, other things and uh, and it's great so we're just we're putting a we're putting a, a, a spotlight on on those type of things uh, so that we're hoping that through soft power, that's going to help to curb so some I activity. love solutions that use the strengths of free societies to protect free societies, mm -hmm. right? Transparency, the rule of law, consensual cooperation, right? Like police having to ask you for your front door surveillance tape to solve crimes as opposed to mm -hmm. without us knowing or consenting doing that. Um, and that's a terrific example of using civil society's voluntary participation because yeah. that's going to be our saving grace, my friends. And the trust is there because it's not, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, whether it's the uh, Human Rights Watch uh, exposing the, the Uyghurs and the, the camps in, in, uh, in China. Um, and ridiculous American celebrities using their Twitter following <laughs> to draw attention to these. That's right. Like, this is how we win, my friends. But I don't want to stray too far from some of the hard technology and military power problems. And as I mentioned, I've just finished reading Elliot Ackerman's terrific book, 2034. 
And it happens in the first 20 pages, so I'm not giving anything that ruins the book away, but there's an enormous command and control failure. It's a technology failure on U.S. forces because China has unexpectedly innovated faster than we have. How much sleep do you lose about this problem, and what should we do about it? Well, yeah, first of all, I think it's important to note this is not a new problem, and we've been grappling with strategic command and control and tactical command and control for a long time through a whole <laughs> string of technology changes, right, where you're going from, you know, essentially visual signaling to telegraphy to radio RF and, and so on. And you think about what we had to do, we essentially had to invent strategic command and control uh, at the outset of the Cold War and continually uh, develop that um, through the technology changes that have led to today. Arguably, there's a huge amount uh, yet to go. I'll say, I mean, the amount that we are planning as a nation to spend in the next several years on nuclear command and control and communications upgrades in particular is just an illustration of that. Uh, but the, I think the key thing, I'll just highlight, you know, there are are a whole lot of ways that command and control can fail. Um, and so one, for example, is cyber threats, right? And so threats that didn't exist uh, or were not fully appreciated some time ago. Now, essentially, this has to be built into any kind of system and actually retrofitted back into existing stuff, right? Um, so that's that's one example. But, uh, you know, we live in a world where you know, we're heavily de dependent on space. And this is here we are across the street from uh, uh, Space Systems Command. Right. And if, you know, I, I'm sure for a lot of people, the November 15th uh, Russian ASAT test was a wake up call. But the reality is that's just one in a long string of, you know, publicly recognized uh, tests like that by both Russia and China. And, you know, as, as a nation, broadly speaking, from command and control, we're heavily dependent on space capabilities for almost any warfighting activity. So those are just a couple of examples of sort of the fragility, perhaps, of, um, of the systems that we, you know, maybe not fragility in the sense that we have a, you know, problem today, but fragility in terms of looking forward over the, the years to come. You talk about 2034, right? So I would argue that we have a clear and present need to make those investments uh, to deal with resilience. But um, honestly, that command and control landscape is far broader. And so I'll just rattle off maybe a few things that I think are considerations that would drive those kinds of technology questions that you're asking. So the first is, you know, command and control has to span, it's not just about, you know, we're in crisis, we're in conflict, it has to span everything in that long, hopefully long lead up. Um, so, you know, improved indications and warnings. Using data sources maybe, uh, like you, know, you talked about, you know, these are in some cases commercial satellite imagery or other tracking systems aggregating huge amounts of data that's coming off of commercial platforms to to give interesting insights into what is happening in the world. So having a command and control system that, you know, covers that span of competition through conflict, including all of the levers that you have to pull, which you, know, you need command and control if you're going to have whole of nation solutions that go across economic or diplomatic or political or technological as well as military. That's one. Second is global, right? And, you know, our topic today is around the Pacific. I mean, the Pacific is kind of like half the land, or not half the land, but half the area of the, the Indo-Pacific, or half the area of the world, you know, huge fraction of the population, huge fraction of the shipping. I mean, you know, so Indo-Pacific is kind of like a global problem to begin with. But then you think about command and control, yeah, in globally integrated operations, it's not disconnected from, you know, in think about opportunistic scenarios, what's happening in, say, Ukraine versus Taiwan versus the Middle East. Um, so, and then, of course, the defense of the U.S. homeland. Uh, we need to be thinking about command and control that is, that can span all of that. Third thing I'd say is speed. Um, you know, 
uh, a well-publicized hypersonic test uh, not too long ago over the course of the summer. Again, uh, you know, certainly not an isolated instance uh, for either China or Russia. And so that just gives the idea of the compression of the timelines. Um, but, you know, to use an example, to, computers operate sort of on nanosecond scales, right? People operate on sort of second scales. So to give you, uh, you know, a nanosecond to a second, in battles, like a second to 32 years. I mean, think about that nice uh, uh, compression in time there. So this is why capabilities like artificial intelligence that allow you to rapidly develop courses of action, maybe automate uh, courses of action, are so important because of that dramatic change in the time scale of battle. So those are just sort of three examples. And then let me just add resilience, right? And I talked about some of the things that drive lack of resilience. Uh, ultimately, we need to have capabilities that are redundant, constitutable, uh, paralyzable. Uh, so all of these things are the elements of those Wait, future. What do you mean when you say paralyzable? Why do we want a system that has the ability to be paralyzed? Well, no, I'm sorry. In parallel, not to be paralyzed. Ah, I, I guess. So uh, it, basically multiple pathways uh, so Got that it. if you are, say, jammed or you lose a critical node, you're not completely dead, right? You have that. You, we don't want to have that paralysis scenario. So one of my, I, that's, I think, really, really important. One of my favorite books about command and control is the historical example of the Battle of Jutland in World War I. I love Andrew Gordon's book, Rules of the Game, that talks about the descent of Lord Nelson's Navy into the Navy that loses the Battle of Jutman. Corey, I was literally, while, while he was talking, I was thinking about what I would say, and I was thinking about that book. I was thinking about okay, Rules of the Game. That's such here. a great example. No, I, I, I mean, you started talking about it uh, in, a, in, a great, in a great way. I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, it was, when I read that, and, then, and there's a, if you want to go look at this book, like there's a, there's a section at the very end, like his 28 lessons learned that he provides uh, from that, that is just absolute gold for people to look at, to think about, because there's so many parallels to that, you know, that first great power, um, first great power at sea fighting since the guns had fallen, fallen silent at Trafalgar, you know, a hundred years before, there's a lot of parallels there. And that, that, that brittleness that had been inculcated into the, into the, the, the British exactly fleet, the fact that the, Brit, the Brits cut all the Germans' uh, overseas cable, communications cables and shut them off from the rest of the world. And we don't have to guess that China was going to do this. I mean, they talk about it quite a lot in their strategic writings, that informationized warfare, that the first thing that happens is they seize information dominance. And people shouldn't confuse that for it. It's just cyber attacks. Like, they, they talk about, you no, know, this is kinetic attacks, too, in their own writings. So this is right. this is cratered communication centers, you know, hit by ballistic missiles and all that. So we should be worried about it, for sure. So I want to I wanna pull this strain of command and control out into space. Um, given the heavy reliance, if, if cables are getting cut and things are exploding in space, mm -hmm. um, how do we build that kind of resilience? Well, I, I think we have a couple things working to our advantage. Just as the Pacific is 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 vast, uh, space is much more vast, <laughs> and so that so uh, uh, you you can't seize territory in space, right? So that so there's what we we need, just need to design and build things to be more resilient. But uh, but I, I think you know um, you know. You talk about the first 20 pages of 2034. I'll, I'll just remind everybody that we had a, our most recent command and control crisis of 2020 when COVID struck is we sent all of our uh, defense and intelligence people home and said telework, <laughs> right? And so, so that, that, was, that was a major you know, shift in, in mindset. Of, and, and you ad, uh, appropriately mentioned our willingness to take risks. Well, look, we have to get the work done somehow. The, uh, so we're... I think Americans uh, and and Westerners in general are are highly adaptable, uh, you know, to uh, to changes in the environment. Uh, in the 90s, you know, it was, we kind of laugh about it now, but everything was about net centric, you know, you know, worlds and community. And it's like today, it's all about decentralized everything. Yeah. And so, 
So, uh, and we have history uh, to help guide us in some of that respect. But, but um, here, here's what's exciting about what's going on in, in space is that um, it's, as, it's, with the exception of GPS and some communications capability in GEO, it's really pretty much devoid of infrastructure. And one of the neatest projects that we're working on in collaboration with the Space Force and the AFRL is this whole idea of this hybrid space architecture. What, if you could, if you know what, uh, if you look at uh, what we've learned about the internet and we build an internet in space, what would it look like? And, and that hybrid architecture would allow you to move information between government and commercial systems, government and government systems, um, U.S. and allied systems, uh, any, any, any combination of that. Uh, and, uh, and how do you build it? Well, you build it uh, uh, using all this data, zero trust architecture, which is not how the, the, the internet, regular internet is built on trust, which is violated constantly, right? So, so zero trust. And, and uh, you don't try to defend the perimeter, uh, you defend uh, endpoints and, and, uh, and make sure that the security, so you have multi-path uh, resilience so that, uh, and, and uh, you, you basically create something so that you, it's not like one, one critical uh, node away from you know, complete uh, destruction or, or failure. Uh, uh, one of the most interesting things to watch evolve right now is uh, the uh, software folks think see the world of the internet as Web 2.0 today, which is you know what is most of the information comes from very few sources and things like this, and and it's it's hard to have trust uh, and and not just uh, the content but also you know, communications and the integrity of the data. The evolution of uh, cryptocurrency, blockchain, all these evolving technologies, which is the Web 3.0, is really the systems. Uh, you know, uh, reaction to to the vulnerabilities t today, it's going to be much much more difficult uh, to uh, to change. And what that's going, all those technologies are going to completely evolve the way that we do information uh, and currency transactions, everything digitally in, in the future. So the 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 danger from a national security perspective is that uh, we still have entities in the U.S. government that are you know, working on Windows 95, right? <laughs> and so, uh, and you know, so we're we're very slow to adopt and, and adapt to uh, new technology. So, so I think what just coming back to COVID and the recognition that you know we're going to have to abandon uh, some of our best practices from the 80s and 90s, and and, uh, and adopt technology that's more adaptive and, and agile uh, in the future. That's how we're going to ensure that we have C2. The good news is that China, I think, I recall, just shut down their Bitcoin miners and uh, <laughs> essentially kicked a lot of them out. And they're moving to Texas, is what I hear. Well, they, but because they don't like it, right? Because they, because uh, you can't manipulate the currency. <laughs> you can't manipulate your currency if it's digital. So, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. I, um, perhaps I'm a saber-toothed tiger gnashing about in a tar pit, but as an old state-centric type, it does seem to me that treasuries are going to figure out how to regulate tax and control cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. because why wouldn't they um and that that a lot of um the churn we are seeing right now as we move forward still does call into question traditional concepts like deterrence and i want to turn to you kyoki for some big thinking about what how conceptually do you think we need to either relax constraints on problems, as we have done with the notion of net centric as the solution, right? We're going to protect it uh, to a no trust uh, concept now. Where are the other conceptual places we need to be thinking fresh? Well, I, I think. A good place to start is, you know, a lot of our strategic deterrence was built up in this sort of bipolar U.S.-Soviet Union world. Uh, China is clearly not playing by any of those rules. Um, and, you know, just the fact that you have essentially a, you know, three or a tripolar world, you know, if you could say the West, Russia, and China, plus some rogue actors, uh, you know, it's just a much more complete, uh, much more complex and dynamic landscape. So I think 
I'm not saying that requires complete abandonment uh, of some of the principles, but you know, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, if you look at what the Russians and the Chinese have done, they are looking at ways that you can essentially operate in the gray zones or move up to the nuclear threshold in ways that uh, that wouldn't necessarily play with the way we conceive of strategic deterrence today. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is the range of activities we have to deter. And we talked about cyber, obviously, and, uh, and so, you know, it goes beyond that to, you know, you talked about essentially exploitation of the global commons, uh, you know, in ways that are not necessarily easily seen. Those are the kinds of things we have to deter. Deter theft of IP and technology, right? And so it is a, it's, it's, it's a very interesting landscape. You think about this broader set of global power competition uh, uh, elements that we're thinking about. Um, I don't know that I can offer necessarily that big thinking that you're asking for here, but a couple of thoughts on things that we need, right? So first, I, I would argue that we actually need a much better analytic framework um, that would allow us to assess you know, what is deterrent or not, or maybe what is the relative cost of this much of that kind of deterrent, you know, cyber capability versus a kinetic weapon versus investing in a digital currency, right? I mean, those are, those are very different kinds of investments, different kinds of implications. I don't think we have a good analytic framework today to tr make those kinds of trades. Second thing is probably the, you know, how do you get to be able to analyze you know, I'd say in real time or near real time, what is escalatory or de-escalatory from a strategic deterrence perspective? And, you know, we do a lot of work where, in the past at least, have done a lot of work of looking at different scenarios and essentially having plans in place. But I would argue that we need to have that capability to be able to do this kind of analysis and simulation in real time. Right? So having that analytic framework and the tools that go along with it, really important. Um, you know, having a much more dialable suite of capabilities. And I know you don't like the all of nation uh, approach, but maybe we don't need all of nation, but I'd say there are some pieces that we need to, uh, to selectively prioritize. And so, you know, some of the things that, uh, you know, from an, you know, clear advantages that the U.S. can put pressure on, and we do, you know, things like access to the global financial system. China is actively taking steps to figure out, and other nations, to figure out how to break loose from that. How can we, uh, as a liberal Western order, you know, prevent that from happening, right? So, um, so those are some of the areas that have technological underpinnings, uh, uh, like we just heard, that we should be going after. So one specific area where I think um, China's technological advances and military modernization are causing them the most kind of questioning about whether our concepts are still adequate is China's nuclear modernization. How worried are you about that? How confident are you, Tom, that we have the ideas that can help us manage these advances? Yeah, I, I, it's certainly thrown a huge wrench into the way we think, thought the nuclear landscape looked. Um, the, this really, dr really dramatic expansion of Chinese nuclear capabilities, although it may not be all nuclear, may be more accurately described as all, long range and probably mostly nuclear, but not necessarily all. Um, so there's a there's a lot of complexity that brings to it, and quite frankly, there's a lot of challenge of scale that it brings to it. I mean, we China is clearly not interested in arms control anytime soon uh, with respect to this buildup, and I and I have a hard time imagining it, them being. So interested until they get to a point of near parity. I mean, if you look in the past, we had we had the example of kind of the interwar naval limitation treaties where you had Japan accepting a lower, you know, five to five to three ratio, and they accepted a smaller fleet. I don't see that happening uh, with with China. That you, you know anything like that. So so I think that's going to be a real challenge to to deal with the scale that it appears is going to result. Um, a lot of it is you know that that, that challenge is driven by. And to some extent, by in terms of maintaining nuclear deterrence, by how we do business and our rule of law, you know, there may be a misperception among some folks that that um, 
that if, if we'd cover down on Russia, if, all we, if, all, if we just have a few warheads left for China, that that's good enough, we'll just nuke their cities. We don't do that. That's not, law of armed conflict doesn't allow for that. It's not, that's not a good enough answer. Um, so, so I think it is going to bring, there may be a thinking required. There may be, quite frankly, a need to keep production lines running for longer than we're planning to right now. Um, as we proceed with the modernization program, replacing aging systems and aging platforms. So um, I think at this point, we, we kind of need to see where things go. I think we're at early days uh, with that expansion. The things move relatively slowly with, with for us, they at least do, with, with uh, significant changes in, the, in our nuclear arsenal. So I think for now, it's you know, keep, keep things moving forward, uh, keep, keep a steady hand on the tiller, to move forward with the processes or the, the programs they've got going and see where this goes. There's a, so first of all, I love that you use the example of the Washington Naval Accords, and I'm going to come back to that. Uh, but there's a really interesting debate going on right now between, <clears throat> excuse me, between Robert Work, the former Deputy Secretary of Defense, and Brian McGrath, the naval strategist, and with with Bob Work arguing that we need to reduce the demands on our Navy because the Navy's not big enough for all that we are asking it to do. And Brian McGrath countering that he agrees with that, but the, you shouldn't restrain the supply problem. You should, restrain, you should restrain the demand problem. You should expand the supply. That is, build a bigger Navy if there are more things that are going on. And that's where I circle back to the Washington Naval Accords because what's so interesting I wrote a piece for the Naval Institute a little bit ago about the example of innovation, comparing Japan, uh, the United States, and Britain, all three of which were constrained at the 5 to 5 to 3 ratio, as Tom mentioned, by the Washington Naval Accords. And Japan and the United States innovated in fabulous, fascinating ways. That is, the birth of carrier aviation comes differently in both uh, but comes in both. And Britain creates better armor for its warships. That is a, a dead-end strategy of innovation. Um, so I'd love to ask all three of the panel a question that springboards from that that, was, uh, that came from our online audience, which is where should DOD be accepting risk right now in order to spur innovation. So let's start with you, Steve. Well, uh, and, you know, uh, full disclosure, right? So I'm an Air Force guy, and I I, I started my first uh, combat deployment in 1990 was a, a Desert Storm, and so uh, we have uh, tremendous air and space capabilities that all have not been recapitalized since I got in the Air Force. And so I'll tell you where not to do uh, the reduction is in those air and space capabilities. You want, you want the Navy to, to fly colors and go in and, and do what it does best. It will need to be fully supported by, by air and space forces that, that will literally you know, crush the, uh, the ability to, uh, to, to counter Excellent those Excellent and non-responsive answer. Where do you take the cuts? Well, the, the cuts, I, I tell you, uh, I would take the cuts out of the, right now, m money is spread peanut butter across the services. And I would, uh, I would, this is not the department's view, this is my view. My view is I would take it from the Army, I would take it from the land component. I would, I would well. uh, And I would, uh, and, and I would take it from our bureaucratic component because, you know, people don't understand that the department is so huge <laughs> and, and the money it goes through. It would buy us a lot of weapons capability if we had a leaner, uh, more agile uh, defense department. Terrific answers. I'll probably be fired for that, but <laughs> <laughs> still a free country. When last I checked. That's right. So. Well, I mean, it's you know, it's certainly easy to see. Um, you know, ask the ask the former naval officer which what we should do, what, what part of the the DoD we should make smaller when we have a maritime challenge out there. I I, I wouldn't necessarily say just the army. I would say the Army as we know it, uh, in the sense of, of a lot of, you know, clearly there's been a necessary focus for decades now on you know, counterterrorism, counter fighting the wars in Asia. That seems like it's pretty much over, uh, other than some niche capabilities. Um, so what, what are we doing to, I mean, really robustly shift the Army's focus to the Pacific and the very useful things they can do? 
to help out in that theater. I mean, because, you know, when I, when I think about w- what are the things that are vulnerable in that theater, you know, and I think about m- lots of satellite coverage, the, kind of the unblinking eye of Sauron over the Earth's surface, combined with AI and pattern recognition, like I see the ability for things that aren't hiding in clutter to survive being ever more challenging uh, with much longer range weapons to go with that sensing. So I think there's, you know, we've got guys, people with trucks that can carry things and hide in the hide in the jungle and and send effects. Uh, I think there's a great place for that. So, um, so th- but that's going to take a some really significant change within what the I think what the army values. I mean, I'm not in the army, but my my my, my sense of what the army values will have to be different than it has been for the last 20 years. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, and interesting. You bring up uh, secretary work, and uh, you know, I think about places where we should take risk, and there's different kinds of risk, a positive risk and negative risk, if you will. Um, I think, first of all, we do not want to be cutting back on anything that would be a sim- asymmetric advantage, right? And so these are places where we need to be doubling and tripling down. So, you know, I, I would argue that we articulated a great offset strategy and the Chinese executed it admirably. Um, <laughs> Uh, or are and uh, so then, where do you, what do you go after? And I mean, this is not a never a fun topic, but there is a lot of I'd say aged and outdated material infrastructure that needs to be divested that carries a big sustainment tail. So that's one. Two is there are probably areas, you know, and I'd say logistics and sustainment, you know, you got some very smart people who are looking at how to apply advanced technology to take a lot of the cost out of that. This is a place, you know, it's an area that uh, uh, OUSD R&E is very interested in. Those are the kinds of places where we should make investments that would actually save money without hurting force structure. You know, uh, I, I should re- reattack. Hold two, on one second. Um, uh, the when President Biden announced Secretary Austin's selection, mm-hmm. he he highlighted the fact that you know with the pandemic and vaccine distribution, we were going to need somebody good at logistics. And I levitated out of my chair at the idea that the American military is the premier American force in logistics. Because if that's your concern, hire the founder of Amazon. Like, there are a lot of American businesses that are really good at logistics. And the way we have walled off the defense enterprise in so many important areas from the vibrancy of our commercial economy where these problems are being solved, which goes to the importance of DIU, stitching those connections, but the other thing I I really cannot resist, I'm basically the rhinoceros of defense policy, right? They're nature's firemen. They go tramp it. And I want to stamp out the, the emergent fire that it's okay not to have a defense bill passed by Congress because continuing resolutions are good enough because that is so fundamentally untrue. And because it doesn't permit the prioritization that all three of you were talking about, it doesn't permit starting of new contracts, and it creates a dysfunctional laziness where Congress doesn't take responsibility for the fact that they actually run American defense policy. We really, really need to return to the discipline of Congress setting priorities and funding those priorities, because otherwise, my friends, we lose this competition and we will be in a less secure, less prosperous state. So thank you for indulging that. And blame Sam, who told me I could editorialize on (laughs) these things. Uh, We have time for just one or two more questions that um, that our audience have put through. Um, this one for you, maybe, Tom. How should DOD think about leveraging R&D capabilities of the quad? And I'm going to want to hear your answer to this as well, Kiyoki. Well, I mean, there's certainly um, things that our allies do that, are, that they seem to be very good at. Um, I can think, for example, one thing in mine warfare, um, you know, we are, unfortunately, the Navy's mine warfare program has really struggled 
uh, my countermeasures for the last um, decade or so. The Europeans seem to be really good at it. Uh, and I think this is an area where uh, we can really use some help. Uh, it's a very, very small portion of the Navy's. When I did the math, it was less than 1% of the Navy's uh, procurement spending, remembering that I think something like 80% of the warships we've had damaged since World War II were damaged by mines. So anyways, um, so hopefully some help there. Uh, I think in shipbuilding, maybe we can get some help from from our allies. You know, if you, if you look at the uh, commercial sector, you know, China's, China's merchant shipbuilding, they're the world's largest shipbuilders now. They built 38 million tons of commercial shipping in 2020. We built 70,000 tons of commercial shipping. But there still remain very large, robust shipbuilding industries in South Korea and Japan. So I worry about our ship, our basically Navy-only shipbuilding base over time, losing uh, the fact that it doesn't have a lot of competition, you know, maybe helping out with some, getting some ideas from, from those industries. And Steve, I cut you off before, so uh, please pick up where you were going to and connect it to this. Oh, oh my gosh. I lost my train of thought, but that's okay. <laughs> they, um, I, I think the oh I know on the on the budget issue and this, here's a real tough problem. What you need to do when you look at the defense budget is you really need to look at the must pays. And uh, it, m most people think that we have a very large chunk of the budget that's going to the, solving the problems that we're talking about on the stage, but that's not really the case. The must pays is really you know personnel infrastructure. Yeah, we talk. Do not, all the real estate, you know, problem. real estate that the that the DoD holds right. on to, all this stuff, and so uh, um, we the, have the same problem in the defense budget that the federal yeah. budget has writ large. Exactly, because entitlements are crowding out discretionary spending. Right, and and so so uh, I'm not saying do away with it, but you have to, this is it doesn't matter which party or what leader you are, you show up on day one in your job, and the first thing you're realizing is we have all these must pays. That, that consume uh, the vast majority of that uh, of those resources, but uh, but I think I, I think that's important. How we embrace innovation, you know, the best uh, we talked about, you know, Thorin's eye, but basically all the the, the commercial capabilities to stare at the Earth. Uh, we you know 90% of what we know about climate change we know from space. Did you know that? If you think about all observing the Earth from space, is that's how that's how we know most of what we know about climate change, but uh, if you want to uh, get early indications and warning of, of nefarious activity, it, it develop the algorithm to give you that. And when you have early indications, you, can, you, have, you have better uh, ability to respond diplomatically, uh, lower the temperature of conflict. And so I think the information and the transparency is going to be a key part of the strategy going forward. It's a great point. Dr. Jackson, I am going to give you the last word, my friend. What is the conclusion that you would like the participants in this conversation to take away? Yeah, I really want to, this kind of goes to the theme of allies and partners, but I'd say equally to this question of joint, and I'd like to tie together these themes of deterrence, uh, technology, command and control. Um, ultimately, you know, Things like join all domain command and control. We know this is where we need to get to. Uh, I think this is a case, uh, you know, to quote the Rolling Stones, right? You can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you might get what you need. We got to decide what we really need, and then we need to do it fast. And so, really keeping the focus and the clearly articulated sense of urgency that you're getting from Indo-PACOM, uh, from the commander, from all of the components there, that we need to demonstrate deterrent capability and create the dilemmas every day and use every exercise and every demonstration as part of that deterrent equation. That means that we need to be rapidly bringing in these prototypes and experiments. We need to accelerate these campaigns of experimentation. We need to bring our allies and partners into those even more actively uh, so that we are you know, utilizing that best capability of innovation uh, from the United States and our partners. And we need to do it fast. Uh, you know, all of this needs to tie back to not just running experiments, but then driving rapid acquisition so that we are delivering capability in, you know, single-digit years, not single-digit decades, right? 
excellent point to end on. I now pass the con to my friend and colleague, the leader of Breaking Defense, Aaron Maida. But before his panel takes up, we are going to take a five-minute break. So we'll see you back after that. Thank you, my friends. This was a great education. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am going to briefly introduce our virtual keynote remarks. Um, I also want to thank uh, the first panel for a really great conversation. It, it was part um, tackling technology uh, competition, this issue, as well as it was part of uh, book club, I thought. I, I'm, I made several uh, notes of books that I'm excited to read this year that were recommended by the panel. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Vice Admiral John Hill, uh, the director of the Missile Defense Agency, was unable to join today. However, he wanted to participate, so he recorded comments for this event um, in advance. We thank Admiral Hill for uh, taking the time to do this, and we can start his comments now. Well, good morning, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to provide uh, you this update on uh, missile defense uh, challenges, uh, specifically uh, tied to uh, competition in the Pacific. I'd like to thank uh, Aerospace and the MITRE corporations uh, for the invitation. Uh, I would rather be in El Segundo, California today, but unfortunately, I, I could not uh, get out to the West Coast this week. So I know that the forum is going to be great this week, and I appreciate, again, this opportunity to talk to you about missile defense. So if we can go ahead and uh, change the charts, please. I like to start uh, every briefing we do uh, discussing the threat. Uh, this chart was sourced from the 2019 Missile Defense Review. And what I like about it, it's an unclassified way to talk about the major parameters that are a challenge to us. It was a challenge back in 2019, remains a growing challenge uh, today. Uh, in the upper left is the, uh, the ranges for inter intercontinental ballistic missiles. You can see the short range, the medium range, and intermediate range as if we were launching from Maine out to the Pacific. You can kind of see the reach by looking at that. So range has always been an issue because uh, depending on the type of threat that's coming in at, at those different ranges could affect the end game speed, which uh, makes a threat a, a major challenge. So I'm going to kind of um, drop anchor a little bit on speed. In the lower left, uh, you can see the differences between, you know, what I grew up with subsonic and supersonic cruise missiles uh, now into this world of hypersonics because uh, it's in the news uh, today. And you can see the, the Mach numbers uh, and then uh, in miles per hour, the uh, really stunning amount of speeds. And, you know, what does that really do to an architecture that's designed for defense? Uh, it really is a challenge uh, for our sensors. So that's speed. In the upper right, it kind of shows you how the offensive systems are actually uh, you know, just evolving over time. Uh, we used to really think about, from a ballistic missile defense perspective, what it means to deal with countermeasures and other penetration aids and, and um, you know, decoys in space and what that would mean for a sensor system that had to ferret through all of that to, to get to the lethal object. You know, what we're really dealing with now is more of the uh, re-entry vehicles coming in. So you see the MIRVs there, uh, depressed trajectories, which really means speed. Uh, now you've got a hypersonic ballistic missile coming in, maneuvering reentry vehicles as to the complexity of that scene, and then the global hypersonic threat. And what do I mean by uh, global? Well, a hypersonic, because it is maneuvering uh, in the glide phase, you can kind of see those two different trajectories uh, there in the center of the chart. Uh, it can get to global coverage, meaning that it could evade sensors and uh, we could uh, find ourselves surprised when they finally do dip back into the atmosphere. And then, of course, you have the long-range cruise missile issues. So I'll assert for you today that the threat has really evolved to a point to where it's really about speed and precision. That is what uh, is how I would summarize that. If you'd have talked to me three or four years ago, I would have said the advent of uh, countermeasures, increasing types of countermeasures, whether they're against the IR field or the RF or if they're, they're jammer uh, type of uh, decoys and those sorts of things. Uh, it's really about speed and maneuver now. That, that is really uh, what we're dealing with uh, today. And you can kind of see uh, the rogue nations uh, across the bottom of the chart. Then, of course, the pacing threat, as the Secretary of Defense has described uh, China in the, uh, the lower right. Uh, next chart, please. So these are just a, a few... Uh, Items uh, from the news, uh, because uh, I tell you, you can't pick up a, uh, a newspaper today or go online and read uh, the news about uh, global events without seeing a number of tests that are being conducted uh, by uh, near peers, whether it's uh, China or Russia. You see the rogue nations even moving into uh, hypersonic testing. Uh, 
you know, it's it's in the unclassified press uh, that uh, North Korea uh, has uh, tried its hand at uh, hypersonic missiles. Uh, so that's the the speed and maneuver aspects are, are really becoming you know, kind of the, the, the big issue for us as we move uh, downstream for protecting the country. Uh, next chart, please. So I want to talk a little bit about our mission. So when you see at the top of the chart that, uh, you know, the three big uh, takeaways uh, for the mission statement for the Missile Defense Agency is it's a layered missile defense system. Uh, we're to defend the United States, deployed forces, allies and friends uh, in all phases of flight. And so we do that uh, by basically following the wheel around the corner here. If you go to the bottom, we're, we're, we're starting off with technology. We're figuring how that uh, goes in, you know, what gaps need to be closed in the development. We get to production fielding, and then we support the services and operations and readiness. At the end of the day, it is all about delivering capability to the warfighter. So uh, those of you who have tracked the evolution of the Missile Defense Agency from our days as a strategic defense initiative, uh, as we came through a ballistic missile defense organization to now an agency that's focused on development and delivery to the warfighter. You know that uh, we started uh, against the ballistic threat. We have been uh, directed to take on the hypersonic missile threat. And then of course, there is the strategic uh, cruise missile uh, threat that's out there. At the end of the day, they all converge. They're delivering uh, very high speed uh, warheads uh, and they're coming in with precision and with large numbers. And that's a challenge against uh, any defensive system. So I'm gonna talk more about that uh, as we go through. Uh, next chart, please. This is an update to uh, what I normally call the, uh, the, the placemat. And uh, it gives you kind of a sense from a detection to control and engage uh, framework that I, that I often will talk about. So it really does start with uh, sensing. And you can see some of the uh, big sensors that we have to the left. You see the space sensors at the top. You see our sea-based uh, X-band radar. You see the transportable uh, TPY-2s. You see the Aegis ships, you see the, you see the transportable THAAD and, and the Patriot. They all come with uh, sensor systems with them because that's where you really start, right? You have to have indications and warning. You really do have to form a track. You have to have fire control quality data with very low latency that's going to the engagement systems along the bottom of the chart. But uh, none of that happens unless you've got rock solid command and control. Uh, and, uh, and that the warfighter's got its uh, interface into the system. And generally that is done through the command control battle management communication systems or what we call C2BMC. That is how we network together our sensors. It's how we combine the data, how we get that tracking information to the systems below. From a homeland defense, another uh, three-way framework here is to look at it in terms of three battles. So we look at homeland defense, uh, GBI, that is its bread and butter. That's, that is what the GBI system is designed and fielded to do. Uh, and so if you move into the regional systems, uh, Aegis ships, Aegis ashore with various versions of standard missile, and then the theater high altitude air defense system uh, with the Army, the THAAD system, you see uh, the SM-6 and sea-based terminal uh, on board the ships today, and then the, the Patriot system with its MSE and uh, as it moves into the IBCS system into the future. Uh, connecting all those together so that the warfighter can prosecute uh, the defensive uh, capability this nation brings forward uh, really is the key to what we do at the Missile Defense Agency. Okay, next chart, please. I'd like to talk a little bit about space. The reason I kind of focused in on speed and maneuver and talked about the global threat is the obvious answer is that if a threat can overfly, underfly, or go around a sensor architecture, then really the way to deal with it is to have your sensing capability in space looking down. Pretty challenging because now you're looking at warm threats on a warm globe and you have to be able to uh, pull that uh, pull those tracks uh, out of the clutter. Uh, we do have the capability to do that and uh, we'll be deploying something in the center of the chart called HBTSS, the hypersonic ballistic tracking sensor um, in, uh, in, in 23, uh, in FY23, uh, so that we can take what we've learned on the ground, uh, deploy it to space, two different companies, uh, interoperable, and then tying into the broader space architecture. Uh, we, we already have uh, the space-based kill assessment uh, deployed today to the right, and we're working uh, with Northern Command to go from hit assessment to an actual kill assessment. Uh, and that's all part of uh, taking that system into full uh, operations. So you can kind of see that uh, you know we, uh, we do operate in space, uh, particularly when it comes to ballistic missiles, and then we're going to operate in the atmosphere and deal, deal with the, uh, the high maneuver. But the earlier that we engage, the better. Uh, and uh, you see the hypersonic, a representative threat there coming across the center. Uh, and that glide phase is what uh, we're addressing today because we do have terminal capability 
But in order to get to the layer defense, as I have stated in the mission earlier, we need to crawl back on that trajectory and take it out earlier so that we have a better chance of uh, survival. Uh, okay, next chart, please. So I want to kind of give you a little bit of a concept for uh, hypersonic uh, missile defense, and this is a singular chart to, to do this. Um, if, if you're interested in a little bit more, uh, we do have a video uh, that's available uh, on the unclassified side. You can find it on YouTube. You can contact uh, Public Affairs uh, here at the Missile Defense Agency, and it, it kind of walks you through our overall concept. I mentioned that sea-based terminal, the SM-6 missile, is already deployed on Aegis ships today uh, to protect the sea base, uh, and it is designed against... Uh, the, uh, the high maneuvering uh, target uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, and so that capability exists now and is proliferating across the fleet. Uh, there is potential to take that capability and move it to the land base to protect uh, some of our, our assets ashore. Uh, so we're working through that. But if you look at the representative threat launching from the right, there's that ballistic phase in one version of this hypersonic threat. Then there is the glide phase. And I mentioned on the left side that we engage now um, in the terminal phase with SM-6. What we want to do is get to the glide phase intercept. So we've awarded uh, three contracts uh, this month, and uh, we are um, now doing our industry discussions, and we will assess and really lock down our requirements as we move into a glide phase interceptor. And you'll see that the glide, inter inter glide phase interceptor does exactly what we're doing sea base terminal, which is we're leveraging the inherent engage on remote and launch on remote capability. What I mean is offboard sensors feeding the fire control on board uh, Aegis ships today. We're going to do the same thing for glide phase intercepts to where we can leverage the sensing capability that exists right now today in order to launch a weapon uh, against the glide phase. And then it just becomes more effective uh, as soon as we proliferate the space capability to track with low latency, with the kind of... Uh, uh, covariance that we need uh, for targeting and, uh, and, and threat uh, track. Uh, and you'll see the connectivity there through C2BMC, and uh, you can see that hypersonic ballistic tracking space sensor at the top of the chart. Uh, so this is the layered uh, defense uh, view uh, that we have against these threats. And if you imagine an air launch version of a hypersonic missile, you imagine something that comes out of space uh, and into the glide phase, uh, if you're in a region where these are, uh, are targeting you, this is the layer defense uh, concept we have in place. Again, SM-6 capability on Aegis ships, sea-based terminal, uh, and incremental improvements, along with the glide phase interceptor uh, coming uh, soon. Okay, next chart, please. I recently uh, talked to a, a forum where we, we got into the discussion about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, a lot of what I uh, said earlier when I mentioned um, you know, speed and maneuver kind of being the, uh, the challenges of the day, you know, is enabled. Uh, our ability to react to that and to defend against that uh, really is, is handled through machine learning and artificial intelligence. We have some basic views of that already in our systems today. Uh, but it crosses the span from planning to the tech track and discriminate. Discriminates our word for picking out that lethal object that I mentioned earlier, the command and control that I talked about uh, before, and then the engagement systems, and then assessing how well we've done on that engagement is really what this chart speaks to. These are some areas where we can leverage that and where we are assessing different uh, types of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to speed up uh, those processes. Um, and I think uh, that it's very promising. And, uh, and again, we do have a lot of that incorporated today. We'll just continue to improve it as we go. Okay, next chart. And uh, as a way to kind of wrap this up, um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, a little bit about um, how programs are affected, just to kind of uh, put it into context as to uh, why uh, it's challenging uh, to get systems out the door uh, as quickly as possible. Right? So I mentioned the hypersonic and missile tracking uh, capability. That's up in the upper left there. Uh, the, the glide phase uh, defeat uh, down on the left uh, initially going to be done in the sea base uh, and then transferable to the land-based batteries. Uh, we didn't talk a whole lot about the next generation interceptor. Uh, that is the next version of the ground-based interceptors that are deployed today. And I did talk about the transportability of that and Patriot in the future. So what's really important and why I started with threat at the beginning is it's constantly evolving. And we, we should all acknowledge that uh, that's not going to change. It's going to continue to evolve. So all of these systems that are on this chart and that I showed you uh, earlier have to be constantly upgraded. And that's an important thing. you got to evolve with them, right? The combatant commands and the services are always going to have a sense of urgency to go do that. 
right? So I'm asked, uh, I would say on a daily basis, what can you do to speed up this capability? And we're going to do that. And we're going to work across the joint environment, across the cross uh, service and the cross agency piece. We have to stay honest with ourselves and we have to be honest with Congress and how we're doing. We have to take care of our industrial base. And I would tell you, it's a huge challenge on where we are today, uh, particularly with a, a global pandemic and shortages of different uh, piece parts that I'm sure you'll talk about uh, this week. But that's important to us, right? So we, we uh, watch the, man, the mergers and the acquisitions. We work very closely with industry to understand the impacts to programs. We're constantly assessing our technical maturity and our risk. Cost schedule, technical risk, of course, that's a classic uh, program manager's issue. Uh, we want to make sure we leverage competition, and we normally do that for speed. One of the reasons why we competed uh, GMD and the Next Generation Interceptor in the upper right was to go as fast as we could go to get to our first emplacement uh, to, to make sure that the, the country is protected. Working closely with allies and partners, uh, that is really key when we take a look at what the pacing threat is in, in the future. Uh, we, we, we're not going to be able to do it alone. So we, we do a lot of outreach and we have a lot of uh, programs uh, with our allies and partners. And then every now and then we, we have to come back in and take a look at our contract approaches to make sure we've got as much efficiency as possible and that we are, again, uh, you know, coming through and being honest with ourselves and uh, leveraging the oversight that we have uh, to, to get our programs across the finish line and get them deployed so that we can continuously upgrade them. Okay, enough on that chart. I'm going to go into a wrap. Uh, next chart, please. Just to repeat again, Missile Defense Agency's number one priority is delivering capability to the warfighter. That's what I'm focused on every morning. That's why it's great to be a part of the Missile Defense Agency. The men and women here, you see it on the chart, a stellar team. We have a noble mission. It's very simple. There is no mystery as to what we're focused on when we wake up in the morning. It's about missile defense and delivering that capability to the warfighter. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Aerospace and the MITRE Corporations again for inviting me to provide this keynote. I really wish I could have been there in person in El Segundo, but I hope uh, that I answered some of the questions that are maybe uh, in your mind today. Uh, you're going to have a great uh, conference, the ability to talk about these things. I'll look forward to the next time that uh, we speak. Thank you again for your time and take good care. Okay, now for our last panel. Um, this one is on the missile competitions in Pacific. Um, and we have Aaron Mehta here today, the Editor-in-Chief of Breaking Defense, to help us navigate this discussion. Um, and, and as many of you know, um, before transitioning to Editor, Aaron was a longtime defense reporter. Um, and I would just say from my perspective as someone who has researched missile, is, miss, missile issues for a long time, um, that I always looked for everything that Aaron wrote. Any, anything that Aaron covered on this topic, I always thought was, was both uh, insightful and clarifying on, on issues that are anything but clear. Um, so thank you, Aaron, and I will turn it over to you. Uh, well, thanks, Sam. That's, a, that's very flattering. The check is in the mail, as they say. Um, wanted to thank Aerospace and MITRE for inviting uh, me to take part in this panel, which I think is, if you want to talk about brain power or star power, I think we're pretty well covered here. Um, to my right is Patty Jane Geller, who is a policy analyst with the Nuclear Deterrence and Missile Defense Subjects at Heritage. To my left, uh, Dr. Laura Greco, who is currently at MIT, uh, also has a, a long-standing relationship with the Union of Concerned Scientists. And to her left, uh, Dr. Craig Lindsay, who is the General Manager for Space Systems in uh, Architect Division at the Aerospace Corporation. Um, we're going to skew any sort of opening comments uh, because we want to get right into the discussion. And the first question that I think needs to be addressed is kind of, which was addressed slightly by uh, Admiral Hill in his comments, the MDA director before this. Some people are talking about hypersonic weapons as a game changer, as something that breaks the strategic defenses of America, that in changes the strategic uh, competition with China. You talk to other people and they say, yeah, hypersonic weapons are nice and flashy and they're the cool new technology and really they don't actually change anything. Uh, our strategy remains essentially the same. They're just kind of the new it factor. Um, and the thing that I have as a journalist who kind of dabbles in these things and comes in and out and doesn't have the technical background that obviously my, my compatriots up here do, what I find myself wondering a lot is the question of why is this confusing? This seems like it should have a pretty straightforward, clear answer. Are these game changing or are they not game changing? And I guess, Patty, anything we'll start with you. You know, I, why is this debate about hypersonic weapons just so confusing? Yeah, sure. Um, well, thanks for having me on the panel and thanks to Aerospace for having me here. I, I guess I'll start. I think 
the debate over hypersonics and what they are is confusing in general just because of the, the term we use to describe these missiles, hypersonic weapons. Um, you know, hypersonic technically means a missile can go at least uh, five times the speed of sound. Um, but that's, that's not a new technology. Uh, our, our ballistic missiles that we've uh, been used to dealing with can go that fast um, when they're descending back towards the Earth. Um, but what's, what's different with uh, hypersonic missiles, as we call, that's what we're referring to, uh, is that they can go that fast, but they're not on the usual um, predictable ballistic missile trajectories that we know. Um, they can either fly at the edge of the atmosphere or um, cruise at lower altitudes and are also able to uh, maneuver during flight. So um, this is, um, that's, that's what's new about the, the challenge that we're dealing with. And I wouldn't necessarily say that hypersonic missiles are a, a game-changing or a, a breakthrough technology. Um, I think it's just we've learned how to, to make these cruise missiles go faster. But I think there are two main things that, um, that are important that we need to consider when we talk about the hypersonic debate. And, and the first is when we look at what our adversaries, uh, Russia and especially China, are doing, um, they're, they're developing, deploying new sort of hypersonic technologies, it shows us um, – their intent, China's intent to, to get ahead militarily. Um, this is something that should be waking us up in the U.S. and, and looking at and seeing all that they're doing. Um, and the second thing is that hypersonics, they do present a new challenge for um, the United States to handle because um, just be, because of their uh, ability to go so fast and maneuver, they're much more difficult to, to track and to sense. And we heard uh, Admiral Hill um, talk about all of the, the things that the, the Missile Defense Agency is doing. Um, we're working on the space sensor layer, for example, to improve our, our tracking and sensing capabilities. But uh, missile warning and tracking is so important because um, we need to be able to see the threat before we have any chance of not only interception, but um, organizing a, re a retaliatory response as well. So this is a new challenge that um, the U.S. just has to figure out how to manage um, both on the battlefield and I think strategically as well. You use both hypersonic and hypersonic weapons, which is another point that you just sometimes see madded around is what do we actually call these things even. Uh, Steve Trimble, the wonderful reporter for Aviation Week, uh, has been at war with anyone who dares say hypersonics, which I often do. Laura, where do you come down on this question, I guess? Again, why, why is this confusing and you know, are we talking about these things in the correct way? Thanks, Aaron, and thanks to Aerospace for having me come at, given outside of the Beltway perspective. I just, on my flight here, everyone was talking about the Army, and I realized it was all K-pop fans coming for the BTS concerts. <laughs> Probably your flights from Washington were uh, for the Reagan Defense Forum, but I was, uh, anyway. That's a little bit of a different world. Totally different world. Um, yeah, so, I, yes, hyperson this hypersonic weapon debate, I think it's confusing for a few reasons. One is... I mean, the question is, is this old or new technology? And it is posited as new. And, and of course, there's a lot more investment in it than there was. But, but the U.S., you know, uh, did a lot of research and development on this in the 1960s and didn't really identify a specific mission for it and, and went forward with other technology developments. So it is old and new at the same time. Um, of course, we all know there's a lot of what people call hyperhype which is really describing the capabilities incorrectly. And I think that's muddied the debate. There's a lot of talk about it being faster and really on all relevant, um, you know, distance scales, um, they're not faster or much faster than ballistic missiles. They're, you know, in fact, they start at the same speeds if they're launched by ballistic missiles. But uh, so, so it isn't a decisive advantage in that way. They've been described as being invisible. Um, you can't see them. Well, of course, you can see the launch the United States will not miss a, a launch of any kind of missile. Um, and in fact, um, especially at long distances, they will generate enormous amounts of heat as they're going through the atmosphere, and that can be detected by our infrared sensors. So they're, while you know our sensor systems have been tailored to, to look for ballistic missiles and are not well suited to this technology, it doesn't mean that they're invisible. Um, and, and then the other part of this is they're maneuverable, you can't see where they're coming from. And again, that we there are existing, you know, maneuverable ballistic missiles or their their you know warheads. So, um, you know, it occupies a small part of this parameter space, which is slightly different, but it isn't um, it isn't really new. It isn't decisively different. So I think um, it it makes it difficult to just to have a technically based conversation about what are they for. In and in the United States, they're really for the pursuit is really for different things, 
then Russia or China are pursuing them for that also muddies the debate because they're not for the same part of the strategy. So the whole conversation around the technology, the strategy are all sort of shifting and, and it's made it, I think, really difficult to have uh, like a thoughtful, informed conversation about it. Before we get to Craig on this question, let me just, the point you just raised about how it, they're used for different things in the U.S. versus China and Russia. Can you just give a quick primer on how you look at that? Well, um, at, at least for, you know, what we think that the, the intercontinental range hypersonic missiles that a country like Russia or China would be interested in pursuing would be to get around U.S. ballistic missile defenses and to convince the United States that it can evade uh, missile defenses. And, and there's lots of strategies for trying to do that. The United States doesn't need to do that for Russia or China. They don't field any sort of comprehensive ballistic missile defense at this point. So the United States is not pursuing intercontinental ranged nuclear armed um, hypersonic uh, missiles. In fact, the U.S. programs right now are all conventional. Um, and so those are different. I think there may be more overlap on the theater and regional range hypersonic but in terms of sort of the strategic range, um, they're, they're looked at really differently. Got it. Uh, Craig, to, I guess the first question, obviously, is which member of BTS you're a fan of. But um, <laughs> moving beyond that, I suppose, uh, again, the question of why this is so confusing. And uh, even if we're, I guess, the bigger question in some ways is are we talking about these correctly, not just when we talk amongst ourselves as people who deal with this day to day, but when we talk about them to the public? All right. Well, uh, first of all, appreciate uh, both aerospace and my MITRE colleagues uh, for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I'm primarily a technologist, uh, so I'm looking at it from the uh, technology perspective. Uh, but I, I would say that uh, really to start off on why things are so confusing uh, really goes back to we often talk about the technology from the what are we going to do about it uh, perspective, but we also need to get down to the what are they, what do they represent uh, to, your, uh, to your point. And uh, what can we do about it, which really leans more towards the strategy uh, part of the element and trying to settle some of those basic uh, discussions on strategies uh, once we recognize uh, or come to some agreement on, on what they are. Uh, we actually uh, spent some time, and I think uh, Sam and some others put out a paper on this, which is really the hypersonic missile uh, debate uh, that's out there, uh, just to try, to try to pull on that. Uh, we've, we just you obviously heard different uh, dimensions just in this discussion uh, just a moment ago about whether they're new or not. We're talking about things that are, that are fast and maneuverable. Uh, we've had fast, we've had maneuverable. Uh, we're getting fast and maneuverable at the same time. Uh, range uh, can certainly be an issue uh, in, in, this, in this debate uh, also uh, as, to, as to what they represent. So a lot of this really goes back to uh, what, can, you know, what do we think they really are? What type of threat do we really recognize them as? Uh, and also the context, strategic versus theater, uh, uh, really really matters in this uh, in this range. So trying to decompose it a little bit into just some principles of agreement on what it is, what we're going to do, and and what we might do about it would probably really help before we get too far into all the technology that's going to be involved in either trying to counter or or deal with those threats. You know, one of the questions that I think we've just heard a little bit of from, from everyone is this question of theater versus strategic. Um, and I think that's actually an important maybe starting point for this question. Are these weapons that are more important for a strategic level or more important for a tactical level? Is there a way to differentiate that? Kai James, maybe you can start in this one. Um, and the reason I bring this up is partly because I was having a conversation with somebody who deals with this, and uh, this is in the wake of the Chinese uh, test. And the argument that was made to me was, you know, yes, this is a, a notable thing, an old they were able to do this, but the big concern is still that you know, these things could be at a conventional level used to take out ships so quickly before we could ever respond. And while the strategic stuff is important, it's not actually much different, as we've heard from some of the ICBM issues that have already existed. Um, so I guess, Pai James, I'm wondering where you come on the question of strategic versus theater level. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, I do think, I think I agree that the more kind of immediate pressing problem are um, conventional hypersonic weapons threats, um, just because um, we know that we know that conflict is probably likelier to start at a regional conventional level, and uh, we need to be able to deter, defend against Russian and Chinese, the, the new threat of the combination of 
uh, speed and maneuverability. Um, and then I'll, I will make one note that there, there is another issue with this question is that Russia and China, they are also, um, their regional or theater hypersonic, hy hypersonic weapons are also uh, dual capable and can carry nuclear weapons, which kind of complicates things a bit in my view, um, especially because the U.S. doesn't have the same sort of um, regional nuclear capabilities um, to, to have a credible deterrence against um, Russia's and China's uh, improving arsenals of, of regional nuclear weapons. Um, so, I, so I think that's one problem that, that the U.S. is going to have to, to contend with over time. When we talk about um, strategic hypersonic weapons, I, I assume you might mean um, like the Russian avant-garde or... Yeah, something that, you know, essentially that, I guess the question is almost more uh, the homeland protection versus uh, fear-level conflict. Right. So when it comes to strategic hypersonic weapons, it is true that so we already can't defend and it's not our policy to defend the homeland from Russian and Chinese massive arsenals. But I do think that there, that strategic hypersonic weapons still pose an issue. Um, if we can't track and sense where they're going, even if they're coming to the homeland, that still um, provides a, creates a problem and complicates U.S. deterrence, I think. Um, I have, I, I think the, the China FOBs um, or the recent, the big test we're all talking about has implications. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get to that yeah, more specifically. But, yeah, so I, I think there are certainly challenges, both strategically and, and and regionally. But I think, yeah, we do – regional is probably the more pressing problem. I would be curious. Hey, Laura, do you want to okay. just jump in? Um, I, I don't have a lot of expertise on the regional question. Um, my intuition is that it is certainly a more pressing problem, and it's probably – more easily solved with defenses, since you're defending a smaller, you know, if you are defending carriers or Guam or some place that you're not trying to defend an entire uh, continent or large country, my guess is that's easier to solve. And in those, um, in the regional systems, the, the speeds are not as high. Mm. And, um, and uh, you know, these ships are equipped to do that. Um, I guess for, for the strategic hypersonic missiles, we can certainly pinpoint where they came from and generally where they're going, I think, pr probably with existing technology. And I'll defer to um, your expertise on that architecture. But um, but I, I don't think it, it would, I think it would be impossible to not know where they, where the, the sending address was in mm. the general region of where they would be delivered to, but not well enough perhaps to defend against them. But again, as Patty Jane said, we're already not defending against the large Russian and Chinese arsenals, um, so it doesn't materially change that situation. It probably complicates it, but it, um, you know, it isn't a game changer in that sense. Yeah, Craig, why don't you weigh in a little bit on the technical aspect here, you know, both in terms of uh, theory level versus homeland, say homeland defense level, um, the capabilities and, and technologically kind of where the U.S. is and how it deals with these things. Right. Obviously, uh, you know, when it comes down to the debate of theater versus strategic, I mean, I think we've made a lot of a lot of great points here on uh, where we're more likely to see uh, some of these threats, but it's really hard to eliminate uh, strategic concerns. This really goes back to uh, our ability to detect and characterize uh, mm. these threats. Uh, so there there is potential for misunderstanding uh, of these threats. Uh, we don't know where they're going necessarily. We may not know where they're going. There may be some gaps out there. Uh, we can't really afford to have, leave our leadership in a position where they've got that ambiguity uh, dealing with those timelines, whether that's a theater commander or whether that's a national commander out there. So I think when I when I look at the strategic versus theater uh, uh, debate, uh, it's really coming down to uh, do we have clarity at the time of the event as to what we're actually dealing with, then tying it back to what's our strategy for dealing with it and making sure that we give an appropriate or we have an appropriate response. The stakes can be high. There's a lot of newness here. Uh, and obviously you're hearing a lot of concern uh, that's being expressed. And this is, a, this is really a time to basically put measures in place to make sure we have the clarity as to what's going on uh, and don't, uh, don't miscalculate uh, and, and have, a, have a mistake as to whether it's a strategic theater. Both of them need the information. They'll be supported, obviously, for defenses, defense purposes and theater. Uh, there's obviously a national debate that will ensue as to what we're going to do about it, whether it's any different than ballistic, uh, and, and that will ensue. Uh, but we at least need to get the clarity uh, on these events. 
Do you think we can have that clarity now? I, you know, it's it's really hard to hard for me to, uh, to to jump into that topic as to where the where the clarity is or is not. Uh, but it's it, it, it just puts more pressure on and, and, and just raises the importance of making sure that we've got the right kind kind of capabilities in place. So one issue that uh, was mentioned up here is that the recent Chinese hypersonic test, um, I should say recent, recently revealed it happened in July. It was reported, I believe, late October was the first to mention the press of it. And there's been, uh, obviously, there's some follow-up reporting as well. Um, I would just throw out that some, some great analysis has happened on BreakingDefense.com regarding that issue, if you'd like to go check that out. But regardless, um, literally, phrases like game changer and you know, the big one, Sputnik moment, have been thrown around uh, regarding this test. Before we get into the details of this, I'm going to put the panelists on the spot here. I didn't tell them I was going to do this. I apologize. Yes or no, is this a game-changing Sputnik moment, in your opinion? My, my answer is more complicated than oh, yes or no. <laughs> my answer is whether it's a Sputnik moment is I think if the, the longer the U.S. takes to debate whether or not we can classify this test as, you know, something that fits a historical event, by that time China will have tested something new. Um, so I don't necessarily think the technology fits as a Sputnik moment. Um, the FOBs and hypersonic technologies that China tested are not new or like Sputnik was at the time, but I, I still think this test is uh, quite significant um, for, for its own reasons when we look at it for what it is, and I'll, if you could come back to me. Um, we'll, we'll go into detail, I promise. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Laura, I'll, I'll try to get a yes or no, but it's, it's probably a failing. Like, no? Yeah. Okay, there we go. I like that. Well, that came too quickly to me. I'm still trying to figure out what would be a good, uh, good response to this. Uh, I would lean more towards yes. Uh, you're obviously hearing a lot of the uh, uh, the leadership, and I'm not just basically mirroring uh, what they what they are saying, but that, you know, when you get into things that are new, uh, you really have to go back and reevaluate your strategies. Uh, so that's that's it, whether it's Sputnik or something less than Sputnik, uh, that's you know uh, arguable, uh, but it is certainly a pause, a reason to pause, and just uh, make sure that we got the right force structure in place. All right, Laura, since you gave the Thanks. Strongest single word response. You get to to lead off the question of kind of why is it not then a a Sputnik moment as we've heard. Again, these are uh, phrases that military officials on record are now using when when talking about it. Right. Well, okay. I only I only have the information that I have no inside information, so I can only base that off of what has been described. Mm -hmm. And um and so it's hard for me to reconcile what was described with the description of it as a Sputnik moment or something that was a game changer. So, uh, so I guess I'm saying a provisional no with, with the information I have. It seems like um, we certainly know that China is well capable in space and can launch, you know, all sorts of things. We also know China has had a lot of ambitions and public ambitions and publishes in the open literature and includes these craft in their military parade. So it's not like we did not know that China is pursuing hypersonic missiles. And, and I don't know what the pairing of those two technologies meant. I mean, one, there, there are a number of explanations just with the, the few facts we have. One could be that China needed to test its longer range hypersonic missile, and this was putting it into orbit first was the best way to instrument it and get a long range and to see how it performed. And that would be part of a regular technology development process. That seems a little strange for me to have such strong reactions inside the government for something like that, but I, but I don't know. Um, the fact that something was put into space and then deorbited is a technology that is well developed, um, has been well developed for a long time. Back to the 60s, right? Yes, and I mean there's more gentle ways and less gentle ways of deorbiting something to the ground. We certainly put drop things in capsules into the ocean or with parachutes, or um, or we have beautiful, you know, um, exquisite systems that can land on a runway, and those are much harder, of course. And but that's what the space shuttle did. That's what the X-37B does, and China is pursuing its own technologies to do that. So that's. When, they, when China was repeatedly describing this technology demonstration as reusable space, uh, as a reusable space technology demonstration, again, it wasn't clear they're talking about the same test, whether they're being you know, obtuse about it and, and refusing to engage on this 
actual technology demonstration or whether that's what it was described as. Um, I, I don't know how it was meant to be landed. If it was trying to land on a runway, you would not be carrying a nuclear weapon and landing it on a runway. So if, that, if it tried to land on a runway, that would probably give some credence to the idea that this was reusable. If it crash landed, well, okay, then you might not, it might have been a failed runway experiment or it might have been something, uh, you know, trying to generate the force of kinetic impact as its weapon. Um, it was described um, by officials as nuclear capable, but I really never saw any evidence why it was described that way. Hmm. Could it carry that, the load, you know, as much as China's smallest nuclear weapon that we know about? Or was it really associated with a part of the, the defense establishment that was associated with nuclear weapons? I, I don't know why that, why it was described that way. But the pairing of something into space, coming back down and gliding, is equally descriptive of lots of things. So to call it a game-changing moment seemed to me to really lack an enormous part of the context. So I was unwilling to take that at face value. I'm a little skeptical without more information that this is something that um, that that we that that qualifies as a game changer. Um, so, and again, the piece of it, if it's just fobs, well, putting something into space and bringing it back down again is not all that, you know, it's really old. Mm -hmm. So um, anyone can test that at any time. And why would you call it a fobs rather than I'm deorbiting my spacecraft? I'm not really sure. Hmm. Yeah, one of those. Uh, general officers from Space Force this week did specifically say that they're, they looked at this as a FOB uh, item. So, again, that's a capability that the U.S. has had for, for decades, um, which, do you have more? We can get that. Uh, we can no? get going. Yeah, but, well, I mean, um, so, I mean, FOBs is interesting. So, it, again, if we're talking about um, strategy, FOBs, of course, is a strategy that countries have used and the Soviet Union used to try to get our own a, a deployed U.S. missile defense system. And once that missile defense system disappeared, so did FOBs. Um, and it's this, it's a very awkward system because the Outer Space Treaty and, you know, almost everybody's an adherent to the Outer Space Treaty. One of the hardest, hardest and fastest rules in that is that you are not allowed to station nuclear weapons in space in orbit or any other way. I don't know other ways besides orbit, but, um, you know, you can't put them up there. So, and there is this, legal analysis which said as long as it doesn't complete one orbit we're okay with not calling it being placed in orbit so you make it go around and come back down one time um, so that's that's sort of the fob strategy um, and it allows your craft to go much longer and from an unpredictable direction so it's really associated it has been historically associated with avoiding missile defenses um, but the technology itself is on you know i'm not sure how accurate um, a FOBS is compared to other delivery systems. I Again, I don't have that expertise and I haven't looked at it, but um, whether it's comparable to using their ballistic missiles, whether it's better or different or worse, I don't actually know. But um, it, as a strategy, it, it says to me that China is looking at, at not just missile defenses, but the suite of, of technologies the U.S. is fielding to um, uh, negate China's nuclear weapons. This is this is sort of evidence that that's sort of what they're doing. Craig, do you want to jump in on the, the question of the implications here for U.S. missile defenses? Well, uh, you know, I think obviously there's been a lot of history uh, in, in this area, as, as Laura points out. Uh, when you take a look at the implications of, of any kind of, kind of going back to a change here, uh, you know, obviously a lot of the debate previously has been about ballistics uh, and what to do with ballistics when it comes to the homeland. Uh, and even if you uh, take a look at the kind of like the kind of the argument uh, uh, when we talk about these missiles, they'll still end up in this ballistic con con uh, construct. But it's the maneuvering and speed that becomes a little bit more of the issue. And obviously, we have satellites that are deorbited. You can see the ambiguity uh, that we have when we deorbit a satellite as to when it's going to deorbit. Uh, and where, so it's not easy. Uh, the better you get at that, the more a concern we should have uh, in, in your ability to, you know, particularly if it's, you know, however it's controlled uh, to do that. So it's certainly a concern uh, that we, you know, when, we, when we've when we changed and we start to think about new, uh, uh, you know, whether it's a threat uh, or basically just new mechanisms in space, 
do we really have uh, the, the strategies in place in order to deal with it? Can we look ahead to the implications uh, of what that might mean and, and ensure that we're not, you know, uh, years down the road in a, in a position where we haven't really thought through what that could actually mean for us is really, you know, when we see whatever the tests or demonstrations are, we've just got to go back and kind of reassess and make sure that we're, we're really in the best position. And it really is a strategic discussion on that. It's about the strategy. What are you going to do? We can work a lot of technologies to support this, and you know, uh, but we, from a technology perspective, we can be all over the place in solution space if mm -hmm. we don't really get back to, uh, you know, kind of like what is the core? What does it really mean to us? And should we, should we, or should we not do something about it? Mm -hmm. um, hey, Jay, maybe I'll start you with this one. Let's switch topics slightly. Uh, in an interview with Rogers this week. Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall expressly used the term arms race when talking about hypersonics. I believe he was the first Pentagon official, I believe U.S. official, to actually say arms race when talking about this technology. Uh, we sometimes will ask people that question, and they're always very careful to not uh, say exactly that phrasing. Um, so that struck me a little bit. His whole quote was, uh, quote, there is an arms race, not necessarily for increased numbers, but for increased quality. It's an arms race that has been going on for quite some time. The Chinese have been very aggressive. The first question, I guess, is do you agree with uh, Secretary Kendall's assessment? And then maybe the second question is um, are, are we too far along to slow this down, or is there still an opportunity to uh, try and avoid an arms race in this technology going further? Sure. So I'm not sure if we can use the term arms race when uh, China and also Russia have already deployed um, different kinds of hypersonic weapons, and, and the U.S. has only conducted a handful of tests. Um, I guess if, it, if we do say it's an arms race, then the U.S. is uh, losing for sure. Um, and I think, so I'm not sure if I would necessarily say this is an, an arms race where the United States um, must catch up to achieve, I don't know, parity or superiority in, in hypersonic weapons the way we might need to do for strategic nuclear forces. Um, but I, I do think what we're what we're seeing here is that uh, you know Ch China's intent is to continue building its military capabilities, and that we're behind um, in our military capacity and capability. Um, so I think the United States does need to, to continue pushing ahead on our own hypersonic um, development first and foremost. And that's again, that's not um, necessarily because we need to, to catch up and um, have the same amount or have more, but because hypersonics do provide um, a really good military advantage that um, the United States should take advantage of. Um, uh, Laura mentioned before that we might have a different strategy than China in our hypersonic weapons, and I, I think that's true. Um, for example, hypersonic weapons would be really useful for um, avoiding China's and Russia's um, air and missile defense, uh, H2D2 systems that we've been so concerned about for so long. Um, they also make perfect candidates for um, time-sensitive targets like uh, transporter erector launches, launchers, or um, critical command and uh, control nodes. So I, I think the United States, we do. It's important that we we move we continue moving ahead with this technology. Um, but then the other side of it is, if we don't, if we do let China and Russia, you know, win the any supposed arms race, then we are ceding that advantage to them. We don't want them to have these useful capabilities for their own strategies, whereas um, we don't, and we're left with um, without this this new, more useful technology. Um, so that answers your your first question, and your oh, your second question was how do we? Slow yeah, it down? I guess. Well, or should there be a slowdown, or is it a situation where it's just you know? the chances of getting Russia and China to the table and negotiating about these things are just slim. And so the U.S. needs to, again, not to necessarily equate parity, but to be able to have its own counter to the situation. Right. Um, yeah. So like I said, you know, we, we need hypersonics we, we, or we should pursue them for our own military strategy. Um, I think, obviously, I would want to get Russia and China to stop and to, to limit what they're doing. But, you know, I don't see, I don't really see us Space right now for where we say, okay, well, we'll stop developing if you guys put a cap on them because um, our military leaders, I think, have made it clear that these would be useful for, for U.S. military strategy. Laura, I guess I'd, I'd ask you the same question. Um, and, and particularly, again, the, the question I'm interested in, I guess, from you is the question of uh, is there an opportunity space here to negotiate? Mm -hmm. Should there be negotiations? Is it a situation where, you know, again, these are comparable to nuclear weapons, where there needs to be 
some sort of coming together to try to cap them for the good of humanity, or is this a situation where, uh, as we've talked about a little bit here, these are items that are going to be conventionally used in a lot of ways, and in some ways they're just another munition, and you know you don't necessarily see negotiations over how many missiles uh, the U.S. and Russia each have that are you know, conventional missiles launched off airplanes or whatnot. Right. So that's good. Thanks for just focusing on the second question, because I actually agreed with a lot of what, what Patty Jane said. I don't think there's a ton of value in um, just pursuing the technologies to make sure that we have exactly what Russia and China have. I think the U.S. really, uh, there's a, a, a many programs right now being funded, um, and they're not all with a super clear strategic purpose, and it is more sort of, and it's, it's important to understand the technology, not, not to see not to see that, you know, um, knowledge about the technology, but I think we'd want to be really careful about what exactly is it for, what role is it, what roles are they pursuing? Um, and I think for that same reason, it's, it's it, my guess is um, that the ability to just limit this type of technology is probably not the right approach anyway. Um, because they play such different strategic roles, um, my, my guess is if there's going to be a cap on them or a, a moderation of the, the dangers they pose, which might be their, you know, you know, short time of flight and difficulty of attribution, any of the, any of the technical things that, that we're worried about speeding up conflicts or creating conflicts, any of those types of things, dangers that they might especially pose are likely to be resolved within a more comprehensive discussion around st strategy. Um, like. I, I, you know, if it's a reaction to missile defenses, it's likely to need to be in a conversation which is all about strategic stability and nuclear mm -hmm. weapons and missile defenses and conventional things. And of course, um, that's super complicated, um, but my guess is that's going to be where those conversations end up rather than a sort of a stovepiped um, uh, technology discussion because they're just so, they're just used for such different things. That's where I think uh, that's most likely. Greg, I see you're nodding your head. No, he's nodding. <laughs> I, am, I, I, really, I do agree with a lot of what everybody's saying here. It's, uh, you know, it, there's an evolution of technology that's occurring. Uh, you know, the U.S. has obviously been tied up, uh, busy doing other things. Uh, uh, and I think uh, both Russia and China, are, you know, obviously time has gone by. They've had a chance to make investments that are suitable. Uh, we really need to take a look at where our investments are. With, I mean, we can look historically, obviously, uh, where they have been, uh, and just really take a look at the uh, at the threats uh, that are being discussed, and just make sure we uh, do a careful consideration as to how far along we need to move uh, in order to be competitive in this environment. And competitive means it isn't that we want to go, obviously, have a uh, conflict, but you do not want to leave yourself at a it's such a disadvantage that it becomes a problem for everybody, not just the U.S., but everybody involved in that. So I think it's time to really take uh, a close look at the, uh, at, at, the, at the capabilities, how effective they would be, where they play into basically our strategy, whether it's on a theater level in a conflict or, or elsewhere, and make sure that we are, we are basically uh, well-equipped uh, because it becomes part of our uh, of our instrument of actually keeping the peace and not necessarily leaving yourself at a huge disadvantage. I mean, it sounds like there's consensus here. Then this CAD is out of the proverbial bag at uh, a hypersonic speed, and it's more about dealing with it at this point than trying to get that back under control, um, which is interesting uh, timing to have this discussion because uh, recently, I, I believe it was last week, the Biden administration officially said it wanted to start uh, discussions with China about nuclear and strategic stability. Um, you know, in the previous administration, this was a big push to get uh, China to sign on to uh, the New START renewal that was being debated. Um, obviously, when the new administration came in, uh, they disagreed, restarted New START, extended it, and said we'll have discussions with China later. And now appears those discussions are, at least in Washington's side, hoping to start soon. I guess I'm wondering. And maybe Laura, we'll start with you. Um, what are realistic goals here for what a strategic stability discussion with China might actually involve? Oh, so the, these are these are really hard questions, um, and I think we should have our 
expectations set appropriately, like not have too lofty goals. But I, I'm glad to see that this might happen. I know there's been, this has happened in fits and starts in the United States has sought this type of dialogue for a long time. And it's gone on in different tracks, track 1.5, and there's occasionally high level talks. But I think it is increasingly important um, because uh, things are changing pretty rapidly. And uh, I think there, um, that talking about strategic stability, I'm not even sure both sides will agree what strategic stability a great point. means of what we're talking about. I think China may have like a much more sort of holistic, comprehensive view of strategic stability and not want to just talk about nuclear weapons. Um, so I think even getting on the same page is a good idea. Um, I think um, I, I, I've been trying to listen to my uh, U.S. and outside U.S. and Chinese colleagues about, about this. So, I, so um, some of the things I think I thought sounded kind of interesting, of course, there is this um, effort to get the P5 countries and the nuclear weapons countries to agree that, um, that a nuclear war cannot be, cannot be won and must never be fought. Hmm. And it, okay, maybe you think, of, of course that's true, and saying something like that is not so important. But I actually think it's a really useful place for the U.S. and China to start, especially um, when we see there are indications that um, China is not confident that a conflict between the U.S. and China would remain conventional. You see indications, at least in the Defense Department um, recent report, and other an analysts are, are indicating that China is looking at, um, you know, lower yield nuclear weapons, more usable nuclear weapons, a different, and perhaps responding to the U.S. development of such weapons in U.S., um, you know, policy, uh, you know, NPR statements that, you um, it might consider using nuclear weapons first in the case where you know uh, there's there's an existential risk. Indications that both that that deterrence uh, and and no first use might might be under pressure. So having these conversations about just let's just agree that we should never fight a nuclear war. We should not organize our nuclear uh, structure in order to do so. That's a, you know maybe low hanging fruit, maybe harder than you think. Um, Discussions about um, no first use. Of course, China has has always had this no first use policy. There's lots of um, skepticism in the U.S. government about it, but it does seem to be a very sincerely held belief in China. Um, the United States may also adopt a no first use policy. I could only hope. I would love to see that. Um, but so then a discussion about um, how how those two countries see that and what appropriate force structures would convince the other that that was a, a, a truly uh, a, a true strategy. Um, those would be interesting places to start talking about um, even exchange of information about missile defense. What are U.S. plans for missile defense? And I think one of the um, uh, the challenges I think China sees, I, I'm only you know on the outside, is not the existence of these systems, but sort of the open-ended nature of the of the pursuit of missile defense. So what is what? What's the shape? What's the end point? What, what can we expect? And of course, the U.S. current policy is not to try to defend against China or Russia's uh, missile, uh, using missile defenses, but to have some, some sort of uh, information exchanges and to understand better what China's uh, uh, conventional aggressions in, in uh, the Indo-Pacific region, you know, what are the limits, where are red lines? I think uh, any kinds of those discussions would be helpful. And I'm one of those people who believe also that having discussions uh, in and of, of themselves, even if you don't land on an agreement, that the development of those relationships are really important because we, we haven't had the same history as we had with the Soviet Union and then Russia where we developed some understanding with which we can judge others' behavior um, because you have relationships, you understand who the other person you have on the other side is. Oh, and in speaking, I guess the last thing I would love to see is perhaps um, a more formalization and more extensive emergency communications between mm. the countries, crisis management. So I think most likely it would be wonderful to see really focused on crisis management and transparency and better understanding. I mean, just listening to what you just listed there, which is, uh, I think, a lot of detail, I think maybe the average person, the average American would look at this and say, that's pretty basic stuff. You know, we 
Yeah. We have that with Russia, and you see in the movies, right? You know, they pick up the president, picks up the line, and tells, "Yeah, we didn't do this." Yeah. Um, it was the aliens. So, I, I guess it seems like what you're saying is a lot of kind of, for lack of a better term, low hanging fruit. That's basic communications and trying to get everyone on the same page to understand. As you said at the beginning, when we say we're going to have strategic talks, what does that even mean for the Chinese? Um, Pai Jane, I'd love for you to respond to, to what Laura said, and maybe the the place to start is that point of, is what we need out of these talks, the, the just basic understanding of what the other side is thinking about? Yeah, um, honestly, I, I agree with um, a lot of what Laura said. I, I was going to talk myself about just the importance of uh, talking and um, trying to understand China's uh, intentions and what they're, uh, what they're planning on doing. And um, yeah, the importance of communication that we have had with the, the Soviet Union and Russia for a number of years. And it kind of goes towards the other point that I wanted to make is that um, we sh I, I worry that the administration or that there might be just such a focus on getting a deal, um, an arms control deal with, with China. And I, I don't think that should be the push because um, arms control is uh, it's, uh, it's not valuable in and of itself. Um, arms control is only useful when it helps limit threats to the United States and its allies. And that's why I think talking is a great place to start and where we should um, where we should go with arms control for now. Um, you know, obviously, I, I would love if, if we can come to um, a trilateral arms control agreement with Russia and China in, in the future. I think that will be very difficult to do for now, especially when um, the United States is um, just beginning its, its nuclear modernization programs, um, whereas China and Russia are, are, you know, cranking out new capabilities. So I think the focus now um, should be on talking with China the best we can as, as the United States continues to um, bolster its deterrence and then hopefully discuss um, future limitations. I'm going to throw a softball to you. Uh, no first use policy. Um, is this something that you do think there could be common ground with the U.S. and China? Do you think it's something that as a uh, a way to build relationships between them and to have kind of a better understanding of this baseline that we're talking about? Well, I, I think a no first use policy would be dangerous for the United States to adopt. And I don't think we should adopt a policy that would be dangerous for the sake of, you know, a nice communication with uh, China. And, um, I, can, I, won't, I won't drown on that along the reasons why I think it's dangerous, but I think um, just the, the two quick reasons are that um, first it would um, kind of a, enable China and Russia to be able to come up to the um, below the nuclear threshold um, line and and embolden them to um, use their chemical, biological weapons, or just non-strategic attacks below the nuclear threshold. I think that's dangerous. And two, our our allies are very opposed to the U.S. adoption of a no first use policy, and that's for good reason. They're the ones who. Um, are on the front lines of a potential conflict with Russia and China, and uh, that's why they're so unnerved about it. And I think it's important we we listen and work with our allies who are are worried about U.S. extended deterrence commitments. Um, Craig, Laura brought up an interesting point about missile defenses, which is uh, you know, China's understanding of what U.S. missile defenses are for and what they're capable of. This is an argument we've seen from Russia for years is, you know, all right, well, the U.S. is putting missile defenses in Europe. That's actually an offensive capability. Mass is a defensive capability. How can we trust it? Um, I'm wondering in your mind how much of that argument uh, you think is deserves credence. And when I say that argument, I guess I'm, I'm talking about um, whether China – you know, believes that these U.S. systems, as Russia seems to at least publicly say, are really just, you know, secretly offensive systems and are, and are threats to them. Do you think there is a real basis for that, or do you think these are just public-facing statements? Yeah, it's not a, it's certainly not something I've heard uh, much of or really can speak much about. It, it does seem odd uh, to, to look at our U.S. missile defenses and say that's the reason for building such capabilities uh, out there. Uh, I think if they're building capabilities, then they're building it to be a threat of some sort uh, for us, uh, whether that's a theater or a strategic threat. So I would probably turn that back into a conversation about what could be accomplished uh, with mm -hmm. said capabilities as opposed to kind of the intent that they're reading out of the U.S. as to why, they're, why they may or may not be building them. Uh, they're making advances. Uh, they are changing things. 
uh, and uh, and it, it is uh, is concerning, uh, definitely, uh, to, to think about uh, speed and agility and uh, making a mistake uh, or a miscalculation uh, in that. Uh, Laura also brought up, a, I think, a really great point about uh, limited nuclear uh, is also a, uh, certainly a concern, and uh, we can't afford limited nuclear to become an existential threat to the U.S. Mm. Uh, also, so we also need to take a look to make sure that if that is or does become uh, part of their plans, that we have the force structure, uh, and we can basically uh, de-escalate and not uh, not have limited choices uh, should something like that uh, manifest. So, uh, the nuclear issue, I think, is something that we should just hit on here um, because we are, uh, I believe. In the next month or two, we're hoping to start seeing some stuff about the Missile Defense Review, Nuclear Posture Review, and National Defense Strategy, uh, which are for the first time all being done together in a cohesive fashion. Uh, technically, that may have happened in the past, but I think anybody who followed the rollout of those things is saying that maybe there was some siloing going on. Uh, so I guess one of the things that I'm interested in, and Paige, maybe we'll start with you on this, um, is... The nuclear modernization plan the U.S. has right now uh, was essentially started under the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. um, I believe 2012 was when it was agreed to, uh, at least the, the basics of it. Uh, the nuclear posture review in the Trump administration didn't really change much. It called for the creation of some new systems, but nothing, I think, dramatic aside from those. And already uh, there's some questions about whether those will continue going forward or not. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering, in your mind, does a plan that was largely formed in 2012, slightly altered, uh, but largely but it kept on place so far, is this a plan that lines up with what's required to deal with China, given uh, China and Russia have accepted the investments they've made since then? Yeah, so good question. I, I think the short answer is no. Um, the, our current nuclear modernization plan was formulated in you know, 2010, 2012 for a, um, a completely different threat environment. Um, Russia, uh, the 2010 NPR actually considered Russia to no longer be an adversary. Um, China only had a very minimal um, nuclear deterrent at that time, and we didn't expect them to, to, to go through this strategic breakout. Um, and the other thing is that our nuclear modernization plans, they were meant to deter um, one pure nuclear threat, that being Russia. And then China and other threats like North Korea have been considered uh, lesser included cases. Um, this whole time. Um, but now we see China uh, on its way to become uh, a peer competitor uh, with the United States. So I, I think just kind of logically when you look at that, we, a, a nuclear force, um, a nuclear capability meant to deter um, only one nuclear peer won't suffice to deter double that, two nuclear peers, Russia and China. Um, and so I, I do think um, the, the two additional capabilities in um, President Trump's NPR uh, will help, especially the um, the addition of the nuclear sea-launched cruise missile. That, that is supposed to respond to the rise in regional nuclear threats, both uh, in the European and in the Pacific theaters. But um, ultimately, I think we're, we're going to need to take a close look at um, our, our targeting requirements, our deterrence requirements, because now, as um, Admiral Richard, the STRATCOM commander, has said, China can no longer be considered uh, a lesser case when it comes to nuclear deterrence requirements. So what changing our nuclear posture will look like, um, I don't know. That's hopefully going to be a project for next year, and I would kind of expect that to come into the public debate for the next couple of years of, of what we're going to do. But I do think that um, the complete, the dramatic change in threat from um, 2010 when we figured out our force posture um, will need to be relooked at. Craig, thoughts on this? On the nuclear discussion? On the other question, I guess the, the technical, so the aspect of it, you know, are, is the, the U.S. modernization postured, capability standpoint, postured in a way that, you know, is still relevant given what we've seen out of China over the last decade? Uh, very difficult for me to comment on. I don't actually work uh, a lot of the nuclear areas, and obviously I wouldn't be able to jump into a lot of detail on that uh, from a... Uh, missile warning, missile tracking perspective, mm -hmm. or uh, how can space contribute? Uh, it's really uh, going back to the same thing as are we able to uh, uh, monitor and understand the situation of what's going on, uh, try to get information to the decision maker in a timely fashion so they make the right calculation uh, for, the, for the situation and don't, don't make a mistake. So I see the value of space here in trying to help in the nuclear discussion uh, on that, but not necessarily, obviously, not contributing. Really to that. 
So the same core concept as when we're talking about hypersonics. It's the same core concept. When you get to the, obviously, to the hypersonics, it's a different discussion, obviously, and I'm not, you know, jumping into whether they're nuclear or non-nuclear, uh, but I would actually uh, kind of uh, uh, basically just, just point out that that the natures of these uh, threats and the delivery mechanisms, everything's changing, and we need to make sure that we're providing uh, the right kind of capabilities to, to, to monitor what's happening and, and obviously, as I mentioned, make the right decision. Laurie, thoughts on the nuclear modernization? Well, uh, I certainly think there are a lot of places where we can reduce the role of nuclear weapons, so that they're not useful in lots of ways. And I, and I think um, this conversation about um, no first use and, um, and allies is an interesting one because uh, it's hard for me to see situations in which an ally would like a conventional conflict to go nuclear. Um, in fact, I think uh, extended deterrence might be best served by stronger uh, investments in conventional capabilities rather than um, sort of sub-strategic nuclear weapons. Um, so I think, I certainly think the modernization um, is, is enormously costly, I think, and a lot of it, uh, it could be scaled back um, in, in a sort of service of a deterrent only um, structure. I think, uh, well, you know who you invited here. <laughs> <laughs> I, strong, I, I think it's, I think it is overkill um, to, to, to be right on the nose for it. So I don't think that it's materially changed. I think that um, you know, China's, um, uh, I guess I would uh, appeal to Rose Gattemeller's quote in the New York Times earlier this week that she, where she cautions against sort of the automaticity of responding to an evolved threat with just more missiles, more missile defense, thinking that that solves your strategic problem, that we really need to interrupt that dynamic in a smart way. Uh, before we just we find ourselves in another arms race, which didn't serve us well the first time, um, and will be my guess is you know even more extraordinarily dangerous in a multipolar world. So you have to be, um, I think, really thoughtful, not just thinking hardware, of course, but thinking it across. I know um, the last panel didn't love the whole of government approach, but <laughs> but this but the idea that you really have to use all the tools in your toolbox to address these strategic problems. So. Um, I, I would love to see a nuclear posture which really took uh, advantage of all those tools. I, we have just a couple of minutes here, so I'm going to ask maybe kind of a closing quick question since we brought up the nuclear posture review and the missile defense review, and, and by we, I mean I brought it up. Um, what's one thing that you're looking for out of these documents that are coming up? Again, the National Defense Strategy, Missile Defense Review, the Nuclear Posture Review. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll go Craig, Laura, Patty, Jane down this way and, you know, it, forgive Craig, maybe from a technical standpoint, you know, what capability are you looking to see if there's investments or downgrades? What's the thing that you think is something to keep an eye on as these documents roll out? Right. Uh, obviously, uh, space, you're seeing a lot of uh, emphasis on resilience in space. Uh, we're expecting to see more and more of that. That's very helpful. Uh, and other, basically, it doesn't uh, cause us to have to do other, other things, obviously, to make things uh, resilient. So trying to build into your architecture so you've got less uh, you want to have less vulnerability. You don't want to be exposed, uh, and, and that's been a strategy. Uh, but you're seeing a lot more uh, more emphasis on on basically just inherent resilience, and not necessarily having to having to do more. Uh, when it comes to the the you know the hypersonic uh, discussion, uh, certainly uh, more clarity as it starts to uh, roll down as to what the U.S.'s posture plans to be. Is it going to be uh, defense, no defense. Uh, obviously, theater is a different situation. Uh, that all helps us, on the, at least on the technology side, uh, make sure that we're putting investments in the right place and building the right uh, force structure. Uh, this doesn't come cheap, uh, so we want to make sure that we're investing in the right areas uh, uh, and, and just trying to make sure that we're lined up uh, with kind of back to the core point of this panel which I believe is, uh, to a large degree, uh, what's the strategy? Well, let's just make sure that we're, we're aligned up with that strategy. Laura? Thanks, Craig. I agree with Craig's first point um, to look for a really uh, a smart, resilient strategy in space. I think we haven't been strategic in that way, and I think um, that helps assuage some of the uh, concerns and anxiety about things like the anti-satellite tests that we saw 
that Russia conducted. Um, it, it's very difficult to defend satellites, but you can certainly defend capabilities that satellite systems bring to you and by, by investing in a smart way and, you know, uh, being able to um, replenish satellite capabilities, distribute their capabilities. So I think there's a long way to go there, and, and I'm, I'm, I would be glad to see that those, if those strategies are part of a, a review like this. And, of course, um, President Biden has long been a champion of reducing the role of nuclear weapons in, in national security. So I'd love to see some uh, some some alignment along that direction. Um, I'm, I'm very interested to see how that plays out. Yeah. Hey, um, I would like to see uh, continuity, at least in the uh, nuclear posture review. Um, I think that the, the current nuclear modernization program we have uh, is, is the right way to continue on right for now. I, I obviously don't expect the Biden administration to have figured out what to do about um, China's strategic breakout in the last couple of months. but. Uh, we see we see bipartisan support for for the current nuclear modernization program, and that's for good reason, um, especially given the the new China threat. Uh, I, I don't think now is time to to reduce the role of nuclear weapons. Maybe it would have been a couple of years ago, but now that the threat is increasing, and and I think deterrence matters more than ever. Um, we also see overwhelming bipartisan support for things like the land leg of the triad, um, Democratic led House and Senate both. Um, express that they, they would like to see that modernized as we move forward. So that's that, that's what I'm that's what I'm hoping for in the in the nuclear posture review. And I, I am I do think that's what we will get to because I think that you know I know the nuclear posture review is being conducted um, by looking at the threat um, and and when when we look at what China is doing, um, I think this it's hard to deny that we need to ensure we have a strong strong nuclear deterrence posture moving forward. All right. Well, with that. Uh, thanks to, to my panelists for taking the time to, to chat with us and to this great event. Uh, for the closing remarks, we have Dr. Terry Buckley, the Vice President of Air and Space Forces at MITRE. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks to our, our panel. Um, again, I'm, I'm Carrie Buckley, Vice President of the Air and Space Forces Center at the MITRE Corporation. I have the honor of closing out today's event. I want to first thank our moderators, our excellent moderators, our, our panelists, um, certainly Vice Admiral Hill, who joined us um, today for their contributions. I also want to thank our generous host, Aerospace, um, certainly Steve Zakwitz, our, our CEO, and Jamie Morin, who did a lot of work behind the scenes to make this happen. And I want to make sure that I um, thank our events and communications teams. I think we all know how some of these hybrid events, that the challenges that these present. So certainly, um, thank you for your seamless contributions and both um, hosting us in person and, and online. Uh, I think uh, it was a, a great job and a great success by, by all. Um, we, we did hear from our speakers today uh, about the really the challenges and ideas around uh, you know, what the U.S. needs to do to respond to the, the, the PRC's threat. Uh, we talked about things around um, the capabilities, to, uh, the ways that we can respond to uh, long-range precision strikes. We just heard a lot about hypersonics. Our first panel, we talked about things around countering space, uh, cyber, a lot of the, the, the nuclear deterrence and some of those long-range challenges that we have. We heard a lot about C2, information advantage. Um, from our from our first panel, we, we heard uh, some of the challenges, especially um, around talking about what the U.S. industrial base and from a talent perspective, uh, some of the challenges and the responses that we need. We heard things like um, disruptive innovation, making sure that we're partnering with our allies, uh, maybe even voluntary civil participation uh, that, that that we heard. I think you know certainly things that we should all be thinking about going forward. From Vice Admiral Hill, he gave a great talk on the evolving threat environment for the missile defense, as well as our need to respond with advances um, to their challenges around range, speed, precision, and maneuver. Uh, he, he talked about um, how we are working to improve our, our layered defense system around sensors, C2, warfighting assets, and weapons. And then with our, our last panel, on um, the evolving missile environment, we heard about a debate. I liked the the hyper hype debate on you know how do we even characterize the hypersonic technology threats that are out there? What are the challenges to sensing, tracking, and countering those threats? 
both on the theater and the, the, the strategic um, aspects. And when we talked about, we heard a little bit about the importance of communications um, and understanding intent in red lines. And I thought it was a great discussion finishing up on whether or not our current nuclear modernization plans really are sufficient for, for meeting today's threat. So in closing, you know, I certainly echo many of those comments. I challenge all of us to be mission partners uh, to and helping our independent war fighting community really rapidly advance those operational technologies that we heard about, some of the thinking that we need in those capabilities to meet those urgent warfighter uh, needs. And we have to do this at speed. I think that was really the theme for today. Um, so with that, and for all of those here and those um, uh, online, thank you very much for joining us today. I think it was a wonderful discussion, and we certainly look forward to hosting similar events in the future. Thank you.